are now entering the Bass Galaxy. This is Teal's Bass Galaxy. I'm your host. This podcast is about raw, real conversations with real awesome people about bass fishing, bass boats, and heck, there are no limits in the galaxy. Welcome to Season 2 of the Bass Galaxy. We are opening a new chapter in the galaxy, and today's guest is... Big Fish Yeti Matt Thompson. This dude is a muskie guide. He's won 11 out of 14 events, the Big Fish Award. And uh, he's a guy who beats to his own drum, has a little different tick to him. But by golly, he is your 2022 Champions Tour Angler of the Year. Let's kick this off. Well, cheers, dude. Thanks so much for coming tonight. And, uh, like, it's an honor to have you here. Like, I want you to know that you, like, the year you've had and what you've done with Champs Tours is, is, uh, as, like, a a guy who just loves fishing and, and loves to keep learning, it's been just, like, really cool to see and you come from a different background than i think a lot of bass guys and it's a unique flavor it's a unique twist and you're a unique guy (laughs) and you're full of yeti coolers and analogies (laughs) and um just give me a brief you started out fishing muskies yeah the old the old gators of the north oh christ don't don't give them any credit it's a it's a big, dumb, flat-headed buzzard that eats when it eats. Yeah. I, 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 I hate when people talk about them like they're magical. There's nothing magical about that stupid fish. I at agree. All. When they pull up on a spot to eat, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you got. It doesn't matter what you're in. That fish is going to eat, period. Anything you throw? Uh, it, Within reason? Within reason, you yeah. got to be able. It's no different than like if I'm dock fishing, I'm not trying to throw a whopper plopper on right, right, right. right, right. So I mean, you got to be smart enough to figure out that hey, they, I'm fishing this depth of, wa- of water or this yep. kind of water temp, so I got to put a this kind of bait in it. But beyond that, there's no magic to it. It's a big, dumb, flat-headed buzzard. The reason that people like to put magic to it is because they're hard to catch. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, mm-hmm. it's not because they're smart. It's not because they're better than anything else. It's because you've never seen a fish in fresh water that's a bigger pansy. Right? They are the by far and above. They're the they're more the than a mark, walleye. Oh my god, they're the mark courts of a fish world. Gotcha. Right? Whoa. They literally are the most fair weather, <laughs> finicky, everything's gotta be perfect and or I'm pissy. Got right? it. Yep, yep. Fish. Yep. 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 They're that fish. But man, when everything's right, there's nothing like them in this in the world. Nothing. They said I'd get addicted to it doing it, and I didn't. Um, but you grew up northern Wisconsin, right? Yeah. Like it's pretty big up there. Way bigger than people think. Like there's a lot to northern Wisconsin. Like it's the bush, it's the boonies. There's all kinds of lakes that people the do big not woods. touch up there. It's pretty. It's pretty cool. Which part of? Yeah, I grew up in Vilas County. Uh, so most people are familiar with uh, Manaqua, Manaqua, oh, yeah. Wisconsin. Sure. Yep. So I grew up 26 miles north of Manaqua in a town called Manitwish Waters. Okay. So Manitwish Waters is, I'm, I'm fortunate enough, uh, my, I grew up in a family of fishing guides up there. Uh-huh. Uh, it's like every other place up there. It's steeped in tourism. 
and fishing was the deal, you sure. know, and uh, history had it with, you know, that's where celebrities went to go outdoors before, before it was cool to go to Colorado and pretend you were a fucking cowboy. Everybody <laughs> would come to Northern Wisconsin and pretend they could fish. That's right? sweet. Yeah. They, they all came up there and thought they were captain fucking Ahab. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you had a bunch of guides that all wore, you know, flannel shirts. It could be 98 degrees out and a guy had on a flannel shirt, a pair of army green pants and a red wing boots. Yep. And would row your ass around a lake all day long and you would catch a muskie. Period. And usually the guide shot it in the back of the skull and you brought it into the bait shop and you got to put it in the cooler and you were the hero. Are you serious? Absolutely. And that was like the thing, like, we're going to go catch this giant. It was the ego. It didn't matter. I mean, when we say a giant, they had, it didn't. It, there was no size limit. Right. And there was no limits. Right. So it didn't matter if it was 30 inches or 30 pounds. You put a bullet in the back, back of its skull and drug it in the boat and brought it in. Why, why, why the bullet through the skull? Well, I think there was, you know, I, it was a lot cooler than the old club, right? You know, sure, the, you'd sure. have a lot of uh, people that maybe were a little more sensitive to watching some burly backwoods son of a bitch just club the bejesus out of a fish like it it, it owed him money. But right? well, like, why'd you kill him? Like, why why didn't you like let him go? Well, it, it don't it, it's not me. This is no I under, before my time. I understand. This was uh, when people killed everything. Yeah, probably. that's a, yeah, it, that's what it was. Sure, you sure, know why sure. why wouldn't you kill it? There's Lots of them, you know. It's only through time where we all realize that dead fish don't breed, right? <laughs> they don't. <laughs> they I, don't bite again either. No. <laughs> I, I, and how often do you hear, you know, when a guy says, "Oh, we used to catch crappies by the five-gallon bucket full here, but they threw the muskies in here, and now we don't." Well, there's not a muskie on this planet that ever ate a five-gallon bucket full of crappie, sure. right? So you, you're your own enemy. You're eating the crappies, by yeah, yeah. You can only catch something by if you measure your success by a five gallon bucket. You're kind of your own problem, probably, right? Yep, and they're probably so big ones. It's yep. kind of like the it's the same guy that's bitching about you know I, I don't have anything <laughs> in my life, and he's sitting yeah. in a sitting in a trailer with seven kids. It's like, dude, you you, you can buy a condom, right? You so, can, you can, and you got seven dishwashers that you ain't putting to work right yeah, now. Yeah, I, so. I mean. If you want seven kids, good for you, but don't don't bitch at me about having the seven kids because yeah. I'm I don't know what health class you had, but I can tell you you got it ninety nine percent of the body that you can't hit an egg. Pull it out can't four not. more inches. That's I, all. Ninety nine. Ninety nine percent of the body can't touch an egg. <laughs> can't touch one. This is true. Just telling you. So maybe you should try a different hole, bud. I got no kids. Don't want a gut. Take it the butt. I don't care. Never had a kid. Yeah. Never had a kid. None. I'm thinking about a bisectomy, like just to make sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's just not say anything about it. Well, think about think about all those guys in the 70s, the 80s, and oh, they yeah. got the vasectomies because that uh, fuck it. Why do I need to be shooting seed? Yeah. Right. And then they still had to wear a rubber because of AIDS. Oh How yeah. How pissed off would you be? That would suck. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, but like that's not real common. No, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Now yeah. it's now it's not the right thing. Now you can take you know the preventative. I I, I don't get AIDS, right? Because yeah. I take a pill. It's yeah. like, Wow, I bet Magic Johnson would have killed to have had that pill. For sure. Well, they're Just, talking about like some monkey shit now. Oh yeah, people fucking bats and yeah yeah. Who knows? Some weird shit. Who I knows? Just, bat. Bass fishing. See, so, this is the crazy part. We do this is what's going to happen. Is we're talking northern Wisconsin. And now we're talking about fucking bats, and that's what it always comes back to: is some northern Wisconsin guys are fucking bats. That's not how it works, dude. I don't even. <laughs> so I don't want to see any creative editing on this that brings it back to Mantwish Waters, Wisconsin, and bat fucking right. <laughs> the cat's out of the bag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't even have bats. So. Dude, I'm. <laughs> You ever have, dude, bats, like, they, that sonar shit's real. I have my active target pinging when I'm scanning at night. Bat, bats just start swarming me. I, so, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I, I don't like bats. No. 
Not I a don't fan. like spiders. Not a fan. Not a fan of spiders at all. Snakes, I I don't go out of my way to play with a snake. Uh, you know, if, yep. if you got one, it's not like I'm going to leave. But at the same time, if one crawled through here right now, I promise you I will step on your ass to get over the snake. Totally. Wouldn't, it wouldn't phase me one bit. No, I'm not a snake guy. Has, so quick, while we're on the side tangent, has George Little ever told you about the spiders that live on his driveway? So I, I've been fortunate enough to spend time at George's place. And, dude, I, if I was George Little, if I was the size of George Little, you could not make me face down these spiders because he's high level with them. It, they literally, you can hear them coming up the gravel in his driveway. They literally tip rocks as they're coming over these things. And, yeah, and imagine being George's size. I mean, that's a that's a life or death struggle. That's like a normal-sized human having to face off with, like, a lion or some shit. George Little and an Arkansas spider Dude, full is a big deal. Yeah. He said they're scurrying across his driveway when he's driving at night, and they're, like, freaking... Yeah. No. Apple pie size. Dude. George George is so he doesn't like snakes. No. Despises who does? snakes. Yeah. Not a fan of spiders, but I think that living in living in Arkansas has kind of quelled him a little bit on the spiders. Like he's That's not what the Smith and Wesson is for. I yeah. I I don't know. I I'm telling you, if I was George's size, one of those spiders would send me I, I would live in Antarctica, Alaska or some shit because... We we just don't have George's balls. George, you know what I mean? <laughs> George doesn't have George's balls. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, that that's a guy that, I, I'm, I'm not kidding you, you would never know if he's having the worst day or the best day. If he woke up with one of those human-eating spiders next to him... Yep. You would never know. No, he's know? very even keeled. And, very even keeled. Yep, could be yep. having the greatest day of his life. Could could be possibly having one of the shittiest days he's ever had, and you'd never know it. Yep. And, and yep. Mark Quartz is like that also. And I think Mark worked for George for a long time, and I sure. think he learned a lot of that mentality. Not, And I shouldn't say it. Quartz is, I've met Quartz's parents, and they're exactly the same way, but I think that's... I, it, it, it speaks volumes to courts and the tournament side of life yep. because he never gets spun out. I've heard that about him. Like he's very even keeled. Newman was saying that, that he's like win or lose. He's the exact same he is. at the end of the day. He is. Which... And he's always got time for somebody that wants to talk to him. Yeah. He's always got time for the people that support him. He's and Yeah. It doesn't matter if he just, and I'll use last year, the guy carried Angler of the Year for the entire series, right? Mm -hmm. Got to the championship and never boated a fish. The second half. No, I'm talking in the walleye side of life. Oh, yeah, 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 never yeah, that's right. Never boated yep. a fish. Remember that, yep. Right? And for three days, never boated a fish. And every day... He was the exact same guy who had been leading Angler of the Year since day one of the first tournament. Not going to lie, man, I'd be a fucking wreck. I, at some point, you, you'd tell a cameraman, look, man, not right now. I can't do this. Yeah, dude. I can't do it, right? Dude, like, yeah, talk about, like, feeling like you're spinning out and letting it all, yeah, like, blowing it down the drain. It's the worst feeling ever. Like, we've all felt that way before and it's tough to like just stay what's crazy about positive. it positive what's crazy about it is while he was fishing that tournament mm -hmm. i can't remember where we were right here's courts losing angler of the year now in the nwt side of life this well i mean you gotta remember these guys are fishing for a hundred thousand dollar checks courts right? has had like Angler I mean, of the, angler of the, the year, career of dreams yeah. for walleye anglers. Angler like, of the year is a big deal. Huge it's deal. a lot of money. It is. While that guy was losing a, a lot of money, still found a way to reach out to me that morning and tell me good luck. Right? Yeah. 
that's the kind of guy Quartz is. Yeah. yeah. Right? Speaks that's volumes. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, that's one of those friends that yeah, a friend should have. That's a high character individual right there. 100%. Yep. I don't know that if I was having that day, if I would have remembered that he was at a tournament and wish him luck at 7 o'clock in the morning. Right? Yeah. So. I have so much respect for, for that dude and, and what he's done. Yep. Uh, just happens. You too, man. Like, guys who are able to succeed at the multiple species levels, like, there's not a lot of, I'm just saying, there's not a lot of guys who 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 have done that or who are doing that. And it, it's it truly, I think, speaks volumes to, like, the anglers you that you and Mark are and, and – like, dude, it's cool. It's cool well, shit. And, and so. I appreciate that, and I really do. And, and and I'll tell you this, when you say it's an honor to, to have me here, you, you got to remember, the, the honor is all mine because I'm still, I'm still a nobody in this game, right? And so for me to be sitting here doing a podcast with you guys that I know all these people are going to listen to, it's, it's surreal for me. But... I, I, while I appreciate it, what you're saying, it's completely different. So, and I look at the guys that I fish against in the Champions Tour, right? These are guys who, a Dean Capra, yeah. a Brad Leiferman, yep. a Jim Moyna, yeah. right? These are guys that literally, if you if you had a bass rod, you looked up to these guys. We had Shane Raveling for yeah. all those years, right? Unbelievable uh, fisherman. We had Jay Carlson. Yeah, unbelievable fisherman. Seth Fighter, obviously. Obviously you an know? unbelievable fisherman. But now I look at the guys who I don't think, you know, like Dean Capra and Leiferman and, and maybe Moyna, those guys probably aren't going anywhere. Now they're kind of on that backside of they've done it. They've been there. They've done it. I feel like they kind of grace us now by fishing it, right? I feel it's, like Moyna's still hungry, I, like because I think because he's more he, hungry now than he's been in years, dude. And and that dude deserves the biggest win in the world. So I love that he's hungry because that dude it was the guy I looked up to when I was a kid. Like I fished a football jig, yeah. and I thought Jim Moyna throwing a football jig was like the coolest. He was thing the guy was in all the land. He he was a god. Yeah. Right. I mean that was our claim to fame. He was Seth Fighter before his Seth Fighter. He was right? the guy on Jim Tonka. Moyna was our guy that that won everything in Minnesota, and yep. then it went big time and never slowed down. He yep. was our original Seth Fighter. He was. The what I hate is that there's a whole generation that's you know our boat marshals that yep. don't know. How good right. Jim Moyna was. Totally. But they're all about to figure it out because I've I haven't seen Moyna this motivated or this driven since he originally left. That's the Jim Moyna that we've fished against last year yep. is not the Jim Moyna that we've fished against three years ago or four years ago. It's not. He's an animal. It, it was a sideshow. Yep. Right, it was a hey, I I got time, I may as well come and fish it. Yep. Last year, Jim Moyna was He's there hungry. for a check. Yep. He was cashing checks and Every he was there for it. the check. Yep. Right. I look at John Figgy. Yep. John Figgy is right on that cusp of how long is it going to be before we lose him to bigger and better? Right. I, yeah. I and, and yeah. I I hate it because he's one of those guys that motivates me on the water. Yep. Kyle Shuda. Uh, yeah. Kyle Shuda is probably the, 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 the quiet name on the Champions Tour. To me, he's every bit as scary as Noah Schultz. Dude, he's a, he's a machine. He owns his style. Shuda owns his and style. And his style is he does not care what he has to do. Yep. He's getting a check. Yep, and he is moving faster than you, and he will hit more shit than you. So he's going to hit more spots with his bait than you every day we fish, just so you know. What's and if amazing that's the deal, he's going to win. What, what's amazing about it is 
any one of like and I'll use myself. If I try and fish the way Kyle does, yep. I've got twenty eight rods on the deck and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm a, I'm all spun out. Kyle can fish everything from thirty eight feet of water to eight inches of water yep. and have four rods on his deck and make it look effortless. Yep. <laughs> to fish at his speed, you would see me need 28 rods because yep. I would backlash half of them trying to Correct. go that speed. No. It's like a very fast paced. So it's level. funny because I, I know you had Ron Mayer yeah. on here. And this year was my first year meeting Ron Mayer. Great. Dude. And, and I've always, <laughs> so through Tony Hatton, yep. I heard about Ron Mayer, the legend of Ron Mayer coming into it this year the legend of ron mayer was you know james linder coming back to the champions tour it was that kind of a deal yep and the very first tournament we're at the river i pulled up on the bank and boat pulls up next to me at the end of the first half and it's ron mayer yep right now i've never said a word to the guys never said a word to me and man we we talked like we'd known each other for years and, but you immediately get a vibe out of somebody like son of a bitch. This guy, this guy is here for my money and he's going to get it right. He's a stone cold killer. So you in this area, you had Ron Mayer. In my area, we have a guy, Nathan Whiting. Yeah, I know that guy. That Nathan Whiting is our Ron Mayer. Yeah, I know Nathan, Nathan real Whiting's good. Whiting's partner yep. as Kyle Shooter. Yep. Right? Whiting's a freaking hammer. I'm going to tell Absolutely. you. Absolutely. People better be goddamn happy that Whiting isn't, isn't fishing, fishing the yeah. champion yeah. store. Yeah. He's good Because fishing. there's only so many ways we can split checks. It's true. Right? <laughs> I, but I love when those guys fish because it brings the love. I love competition, dude. I do, too. I do. I just, the thing you for You scared me, of Whiting? Are you scared? Scared? Are you scared, man? I'm not spider scared. <laughs> he doesn't scare me like a spider does. It's just, I don't like feeling like I'm fishing for second place. Dude, and you're the angler of the year. We're going to just, we're yeah, just going to stop what we're talking deal. about right now. Here's the deal. When you pull up to a lake... In my neck of the woods on Derby Day. And I, so let me back up. I hate the word Derby. Okay. We don't run fucking Tony horses. Tony does too. <laughs> we don't run horses. Derb. Uh, grimy Derb. Derb. It's nonsense. Okay. <laughs> if, if, if people still owned Webster dictionaries, we could all get everybody to stop saying the word Derby. Can we right? call them Mega Bowl? No. It's, it's, a, no. it's a lake. It's a no, big it's bowl. Tournament. Mega Bowl. It's a tournament. Okay. So, anyways, <laughs> when you pull up, for a tournament yep. in my neck of the woods. Yep. We all know these lakes. It's no different than you guys fishing yep. league Fizzles night around here. here. Yep. Right? Your Ron Mayer is Nathan Whiting for us. Yep. Nathan doesn't show up that much anymore, but yep. when he does, there's an immediate level subconsciously that says, <sighs> fuck, <laughs> fucking Second place, I guess, isn't that bad. That's Shane. That was that was Shane. And that, that was is Seth. that, that was, is Shooter. That's Shooter. It's yep. Shooter now. So you got to remember, I was feeling pretty goddamn good about the run I was having on the Champions Tour. Yep. I've had some pretty incredible head-to-head -head battles with Noah. Yep. Man, the last two years, Kyle Shooter. I cannot, if it's not, if I can get Noah in my rear view mirror, I got Kyle in front of me. And if yeah. I can get Kyle in my rear view mirror, I got Noah sitting in front of me. And it's like, you know what? I Back the fuck up. Because those guys, those guys are a different level. That I guess my point of this whole thing. <laughs> is I look at the level of what's there. And, and I'm going to use a Dean Capra and a Brad Leiferman. Mm -hmm. Dean Capra and Brad Leiferman don't fish that level anymore. Yep. 
Jim Moyna spent two years not fishing that level on the Champions Tour. Yep. This year, Jim Moyna put his foot back on the gas. Yep. I promise you, Dean Capra and Brad Leiferman didn't forget how to fish. Those fuckers are still every bit as good as they've always been, if not better, because of the They're tricks they've pioneers, learned. pioneers, dude. Yeah. If they decide to put their foot back on the gas, this whole dynamic changes immediately. It does. I agree. And and I'll use if anybody doubts me on that, look at when Shane and Matt paired together. Right? Shane hadn't forgotten how to put his foot on the gas. Mm-hmm. But when him and Peters partnered together, that was just about an unstoppable force for an entire year on the Champions Tour. Matt Peters had a fucking year that year. I think he would be the first to tell you that he drove Shane, Shane drove him. Yep, they roomed together. And, yep. and they just, when you've got that level of competition side by side with each other. When you put those two crackheads together. Can yeah. you imagine being in that room? <laughs> no, I, well, no. Yes, no, no, no. no. I, no. I can't imagine. Uh, so I, I've, you know, I, I've i wondered what it would be like to share a boat with Dean, right? <laughs> but then I watch Dean in these tournaments, and I'm like, fuck, I, I couldn't even sit in his pastor seat because I'd be like, dude, I, are we going to die? <laughs> Because he's just jumpy. Oh my God. I've yeah. never seen. Yeah. I've never seen reflexes. That dude is an absolute mongoose. Yeah. In the boat. Yeah. I mean, over shit that uh, clearing stuff. Yeah. And, you know, on his way to grab, drop this rod, pick this rod up, spin on this, tie it up, and hit the front deck and have a cast halfway off while he's dropping the trolling motor in. And make two turns in the handle and have the trolling motor back up, the big motor fired up and leaving. It's like, I, what the fuck just happened there? That's like shooter. What just happened? Yeah. I, I, I mean, seriously, how would you know that it wasn't worth it halfway into a cast that you, you just Capra drove all that? the way over here? That's I've, Capra. Wow. It's unbelievable. But you look at that level of success and it's like, man, that's why that guy has... Dude's done everything there is to do in this. In this He's got in nothing. Parts. So the key with what I'm saying here is when I, when I say I feel like these guys grace us by fishing this deal, you've got guys that are trying to make their name in right. this, and, and yep. the Champions Tour is the biggest format that we have in the state of Minnesota. It is in the four state area, yeah. in five state area, Jim six Moyna, state area. Jim Moyna, Dean Capper, Brad Leiferman, yep. they don't need this. No. Right, they they got nothing to prove. Nope. If anything, I give them all the credit in the world for fishing this thing because they're damned if they do, they damned if they don't. Yep. Right. If they don't do well, everybody's looking at them like, "Wow, what's wrong with these guys?" Yep. Right. If they do win, well, they were supposed to win. It's yep. it's Dean Capper, it's yep. Brad Life from Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. It's Jim Moyna. Right. So they're in the crappiest position that they could ever be in, yep. and they still fish it. Yep. When we had James Linder. James Linder would be the first to tell you he wasn't here about a check. Now, he was about as competitive as it got. It was his chance to be with the guys. It was the camaraderie. Yep, yep, yep. Right? Yep. And I think there's a part of me that missed that whole point of it until he said it, where it was like, well, son of a bitch. We're, we're, not, we're not enemies here, right? And I got a chance to... I've always known who Brad Leiferman was, but I never knew Brad Leiferman, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Dustin Bufflin. We got a guy who's one of the biggest names to ever play the sport of hockey. Yep. Has won. A Stanley Cup. A Stanley Cup. And not just won it, but actually contributed to the point where. One of the star players. He, I mean, he. They couldn't afford him. He was a guy who won a Stanley Cup. He he wasn't on a team that won a Stanley Cup. Dustin yep. Bufflin won a Stanley Cup. Yep. Right? We fish with Dustin Bufflin. It's pretty cool. Right? Yeah. We fish with Dustin Bufflin. And he can and, catch him. And God forbid that guy ever decides, and I mean this, and people can tell me I'm wrong all they want. Dustin Bufflin has been 
the best at whatever he's chosen to do, right? Yep. Chose to skate, won his Stanley Cup. Yep. Now he's chosen to fish. If he decides he wants to be the best, Katie, bar the door. Dustin's going to start taking checks. Right now, Dustin is fishing, enjoying it, yep. enjoying the time with the guys. Retirement, you know, yep. he's, yeah, he worked. That guy NHL is a job. He's it's a full time job. Dustin Bufflin is a star athlete who has a work ethic that none of us understand. We don't. We don't mm -hmm. because no matter what we've done, we've never had to have that level. The play, right? the injuries, the the pain, the the shit you have to push through with that, and I'm sure mili like guys in the military can maybe relate with that. Well, you know, but. absolutely. But take it this way. So he comes, he, Dustin comes from a world that you can be the best kid in your high school, yep. right? Yep. And, and everybody in the high school had that kid that played hockey, football, baseball, right? Yep. Was the best in school. When he got to college, he was on a team with every kid that, that was, was the, the best, best at his school. school, right? Right. So now all of a sudden was, is he the best on that team? Well, maybe he was still top three on that team. Now, all of a sudden, he makes it to the pros, where everybody that's there was the best in college. Yep. Right? Yep. The best of, like, three teams, probably. Exactly. Yeah. And now, in hockey, you're not just talking about stateside. You're talking about Canada. You're talking about Europe. Yep. You're talking about, I mean, you're talking about a national system that that's all they have is hockey Dustin Bufflin had to train himself to be the best. Attention all smallmouth anglers. Have you thrown the marabou jig? Have you thrown the hair jig? Well, if you have, you're going to want to listen right now. This podcast is brought to you by Veselka Fishing and Customs, a custom rod shop based out of Minnesota, and he has developed the answer, folks. What if I told you you could throw that marabou jig 30 to 50% further than you're casting it right now. Well, the well, Dane, Mr. Veselka himself, has developed the answer. It's a custom eight foot hair jig rod developed on a steelhead fly blank. He's put custom fly guides on this, so you're really going to be able to outcast the competition, catch more smallmouth. They aren't going to see you. What more do you need? Here's what I need you to do right now. Visit VeselkaFishing.com. That's V-O-C-E-L-K-A Fishing.com. This is the 8-foot hair jig rod, but this guy can build you anything you want. If you can dream it, he can do it. This episode is brought to you by Just North of Memphis Barbecue. This is world champion barbecue. If you smoke meat, and you don't like good barbecue, I do not know what to tell you right now besides you need to try some of this stuff. They've got their rub. They've got their sauces right on their website. They've got their famous dry rub award-winning seasoning that you can put on ribs, brisket, pulled pork, chicken, wings, anything you like to put on the smoker, on the oven, on the grill, any meat you like to cook. You need some of this dry rub seasoning in your life. But don't forget the sauce because that's award-winning world champion sauce here. No matter what flavor you like, they've got three different sauces and they are all good. You can drink them straight out the bottle. We've got Sweet Christie's for all you sweet loving barbecue folk. We've got Christie's Mischief for all you spicy bass anglers out there. And then we've got Christie's Gold and <laughs> they'll sell all three of them in a combo but you need to go to their website right now it's jnomemphis.com that's jnomemphis.com dry rub sauce barbecue let's go of the best if he decides he's going to be better than us in fishing the guy can do it oh for sure without a doubt there's not a, a, a i would I would never bet against Dustin Bufflin. No, and it kind of reminds me of one of my favorite things that my dad told me when I was a kid, and it just always rang true, is whether you believe you can or you can't, you are right either way. And yeah. that's like, I mean, always it's rang incredible. true. It's incredible. It is. Yeah. 
It yeah, is. You're right either way. And like to your point, set your mind to something. He's proven that he can. He he knows like he's done it before, right? But he's he's one step away from having his aha moment, right? We've all at some time in our life, especially now, like for me, with the Champs Tour, it's been a series of aha moments, mm-hmm. right? Aha, I'm fishing mm-hmm. the Champions Tour. Aha, I'm doing it wrong, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Aha, I can do this. It's been a series of aha moments. I can relate with that. And the key is when... You, if you can realize them for yourself. Yep. Right? The hardest aha moment to have is your own. You can see it for anybody else, but trying to have your own is nearly impossible. It, it's that epiphany, right? Like uh, they say Western society, like the one art we've lost is like meditation, right? Right. Like that, that whole... It, it's that whole finding that aha moment. Yep, yep. Right? We yep. don't know how to critique ourselves anymore Mm -hmm. because critique is wrong now you're not allowed to critique right right we're all winners yep well guess what we're not all winners it it turns out noah schultz is kicking my ass turns out he he was the winner most of all but you were the winner of big bass and angler of the year and ultimately i we we do need to talk a little bit about i like at the end of the day I want to fucking know, <laughs> and I know the rest of the world is looking at this like this is mathematically impossible. Um, like that's so many coolers. Like how many coolers is that? <laughs> well, I mean, okay. so eleven. What ten out of fifteen? Ten. ten out of fifteen. Mother of God! I hey, I got one of the five that you didn't get. I, I didn't, don't think you were fishing. Though, I didn't so. fish. Fuck. But I did <laughs> hand it to you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks for not fishing. I, Actually, uh, I might I might have had you had it on. <laughs> no, Screwed no. Like up, I but. said, you earned that one. That was. Uh, here's the thing, and I mean this: when people say how many of you won, until this year, I didn't know how many I won. All I could tell you was the number five. There's five that I haven't won. <laughs> Those are the ones that bother me. Gotcha. Those are the ones that bother me. I couldn't tell you half of the ones that I've won, but I can tell you every one that I've lost what beat me. That's kind of a glass half empty perspective, don't you think? No. No? No. Uh, so, it's, it's mad, Adam. So do you like, would you rather catch the big fish of the tournament or win? Like, it's, so it's. It's kind of become this freaking thing for you where... So I remember like, what I said about like a Dean Capra. Damned yeah. if you do, damned if you don't. Yep. I've, I've created a monster now. Yep, you right? have. You have. If I don't win it, yep. it's what the hell's wrong with it. If I do win it, I was supposed to win it. No, you're not supposed to win it anymore. So like, no, there's nothing wrong with you not winning it. Because mathematically, like... I, it's the, the... It's funny because... I heard this year from a, a group of boat marshals the the mantra was another Yeti, another day. <laughs> That's literally, they, they just, they have side bets and yeah, it's not even a, a, a tight race on who's going to win it. It's just, well, he's going to win it. So who's going to challenge him for it? And, and, and I will say this, and I mean this talking about the evolution Yep. Of the champions tour, because I watch everybody. I, it's kind of it's kind of my job in my career as a in the fire service to to watch people perform. Yep. Right. I need to I I need to know what that person does in situational. Mm-hmm. Right. I, so my situational awareness is always heightened. I'm always watching. I'm always learning. I'm always. Paying That's attention. a fisherman's kind of thing is to be very aware yeah, of. It's, yeah, I, I have to, yep. right? Yep. So I watch the Champions Tour. And if I walked away today, today, if I never fished another one, 
there's two guys that I firmly believe not only will do exactly what I've done with the Yetis, but will pass me. And I would say it's you and it's Hunter Went. I appreciate that because you're going to tell me all the secrets of how I've done it 10 times and then I'm going to go do it myself. No, you you won't. And and so here's... (laughs) No, no, no. no, That that is so flattering. And I hope you're right. But thank you. I, I, I watch you and Hunter and you have the tools in the bag, but you're willing to use them. So here's here's the key with my success, and I hope everybody's listening here. Yeah, because the secret? I'm, yeah. It, 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 the secret is there is absolutely no secret at all to what I do. So I want everybody who's listening to this show right now to think about the Champions Tour of 50 anglers, right, that are coming in to fish the Champions Tour, take every name that you know, whether it's from Andy Nichols to Jim Moyna. Yep. Right? Every angler that fishes the Champions Tour has won. Period. Has won. Yep. One, two, 150, it doesn't matter, has won five fish tournaments. Yep. Right? Yep. So I've fished against 49 of the best five fish fishermen in this state, right? Yep. But here's the key. 49 anglers get to every event at the Champions Tour. They pre-fish different. They fish tournament day different. They put a number in their mind. I hear it at every video, 80 pounds, 100 pounds, 150 pounds. Right? I want you to look at every tournament. Sure, somebody might catch 100 pounds, but look at second, third, and fourth. Right? So, here's the secret. I'm making the quotes here. The secret for me is I don't fish any differently in a Champions Tour event than I would in a five-fish tournament. But how many five fish, fish tournaments do you fish? Not that many. I I had not fished many, but that's Sorry. all I had done. Right, 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 right. So I didn't know any difference. So I'm not that's a fair. guy. I was never a guy that was trying to catch a lot of fish. Sure. Schooling fish never meant anything to me. When I was musky fishing, I was never looking for a lot of fish. I didn't care if I could catch seven thirty inches. Yep. I wanted one over fifty. Yep. Right. I fish the Champions Tour no different than if I was fishing a five-fish tournament. And everybody that I've told that to says that they sit back and have a little aha moment of, well, holy shit, that makes sense, right? But then they get to the next tournament and they go right back to, I got to catch 100 pounds or I got to catch 60 fish or I got to catch 30 fish per half. When you're fishing a five turn five fish tournament, nobody says, "Man, I got to catch thirty fish this half, or I'm screwed." Right, right. Right. Now, the beauty of this format is that while I'm fishing for those five fish, yep, whatever I catch along the way, nine times out of ten it counts. It's like, well, holy shit, there's a bonus. But but Matt, I have heard people say what you said. Let's dig a little bit deeper there because, like Ron said, that I don't fish any different than I do. But in he a does. Five fish. He does. I, I, I I, him, yeah, that's so. Fair. I watched Ron on Serpent pre-fish. Yeah. Right. If it was a five-fish tournament, I promise you, I wouldn't have seen Ron in ten of the places that I saw him. He wouldn't have left three of his places that he was pre-fishing because I know what he was finding there pre-fishing because I found the same thing. And the only reason that I didn't go there was if anybody was going to catch him, it was going to be either him or Hunter. Yep. And unfortunately for Ron, I think Hunter beat him to that spot. So, but I, uh, everybody says, no, 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 I do it the same way. I do it the same way. No, you don't. No, you don't. Think about the five fish tournaments you've won. Think about what you've done on the champions tour and and you're, and I'm going to use you. Right? Yeah, no. Yeah. How many times have you fished five fish tournaments on Gull Lake? A lot. Okay. 
How many of the spots that you would fish a five fish tournament on Gull Lake did you set up shop on at the Champions Tour? None in the first half. Pretty much all of them in the second half. In the second half. Now, that was a weather <laughs> and, and, lake and split. a lake split. Yep. Right? Yep. But it almost won you the tournament. It did. Right? Yep. What if you'd have done in the first half? Could you have won it? I, I think that first half I had the best... I did the same thing in the first, the pattern I yep. did was the same thing in the first but half. not that to I, the spots. No, I couldn't run to the spots that I would have in a five fish. Okay. Like, no. you know what I mean? I, or I would have sat on one spot, but there was a boat on it. I'm going to use, I'm going to use Tony hat. And gull is a lake where if you're fishing offshore, typically it, it bodes well for like fishing for five. Right. And a classic bass format. So you here's know, not all lakes are that way. So I'm fortunate enough that Tony Hatton's my travel partner. Great dude. Right? Yep. It, not only is he a great dude, but it's only a matter of time before he's got that crystal trophy over his you. head. I learned a lot from that dude, and that dude is he's he's gonna get one. And well, it's but only a matter of time. He's I mad at it. I don't know that I would have said three years ago. It's only a matter of time before Tony Hatton and I hold a crystal trophy. I don't know that I would have said it. Tony is having the same aha epiphany as me of you don't need 100 pounds. Right. You don't have to catch 100 pounds. Right. Go out, fish, fish no different than I was for, for a five-fish tournament. Now, everything I can catch while I'm looking for those giants – fantastic right and at the end of it i'm going to figure out okay i'm going to set my goal at 12 fish or i'm going to set my goal at 10 fish a half yep it's and what you saw this year was tony and i in the running for angler of the year yeah the whole way through this season yep because tony tony fell into he may never say it out loud he may not have realized it Tony fished like I've fished this year. Now, I'm not saying in the spots. His Him and style. I fish completely yep. different. No, he found his aha moment. He found his groove. Yeah. Tony found yep. his groove. I'm going to use you. Two tournaments into it, you were spun out. Yeah, I was on suicide watch, border. You were spun out. Yeah. What did I tell you? Yeah, no, I credit a lot. You're one of. I owe you a lot for that You're talk, one dude. of the best five fish fishermen I know. Why aren't you doing it? Right. Why are you changing it? Why are you going out there and doing something? Go do what you do. Do what brought you here. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't care if Matt Thompson hates throwing a drop shot. If you're a drop shot guy and you've been winning tournaments on drop shots, mm -hmm. don't put that goddamn drop shot down. Agreed. Don't yep. put it down. Yep. Right? Yep. If you're a jig fisherman, yep. man, Put peel a jig the, in your peel hand. the jerk the, the the skirt off that jig. I yep. don't care. Right. Run what brung you to the party. Yep. Right? We're all at this party because of what we did fishing five fish tournaments. Mm -hmm. Why are you reinventing the wheel? I heard John Ficky say probably the most interesting thing I've heard on your podcast of he feels like this has really hindered him or affected how he fishes five fish tournaments. Yeah. Yeah. And he truly believes that. And, and, and I really truly believe it's because he's trying to reinvent the wheel. If John Figgy went fishing, but he's simple, he's a simpleton. He does. He, th he throws like a jig, a drop shot and a Texas rig. Yep. And a chatter buggy and a, like, that's what he throw. Like, but it's pre fishing. Senko. Right? It's the, yeah, yeah. what am I looking for? John, when he's pre fishing for a five fish tournament, mm -hmm. that guy's looking for a 25 pound sack. Yeah. When the, the worst thing that ever happened to him was the Champions Tour event on Lahamadu where he just sacked him up on. It was on the Russian. Finesse, it right? was the Russian. I yeah. blame the Russian. Yeah. So now, <laughs> now he's got it in his head that he, I, I got to, when he's pretty I got to find a Russian. He's got to find a hundred pounds. I yep. got to find a hundred pounds. I yep. got to find a hundred pounds. And then looking it, for it, mother Russia. I heard Matt Peters this year say, you know, I completely missed out I, I, on the hair jig bite, right? Didn't yeah. dawn on him. 
Why didn't it dawn on you? Because you were so focused on the history of, I got to catch 100 pounds. Yeah. Look at the weight that it took at the river this time, right? Brutal. You got to get over this, I got to catch 100 pounds. You got to get over this, I got to catch 75 fish. Now, here's the negative side of that. I still have never won one of these events. I've been second three times, right? Which not a lot of people can say that. So yeah, well, be proud. Of also, that. nobody knows that because nobody remembers second place. Well, just <laughs> so. that's a beautiful skirt to wear <laughs> well, as a bridesmaid. Yeah, yeah, it is. But I hear you, though. It's I hear you. It's one of those things that to me in life, just like introspective, when I when I say people don't know how to look at themselves in the mirror anymore and critique themselves, commitment. People don't make commitments anymore and honor a commitment and carry a commitment through, Yeah. right? They're all about a commitment until things change and yep. things get bad and then it's throw caution to the wind and you got to do something else, Yep. right? If you can train yourself to make a commitment and honor a commitment and carry it through, at the end of the day, win, lose, or draw, you may... You, you, you won, yep. right? You, you, you Are you talking like a mental commitment? The to... mental commitment of I'm only going to focus on big fish, Yeah, right? I've made a mental commitment since my second year at the Champions Tour to run a three-pound average. Got it. That's my commitment. So win, lose, or draw, two fish or 50 fish, I'm yep. looking to have a three pound average. I, in order to have that three pound average, I may have a six pounder. Right. Right. Yep. But yep. at the end of the tournament, if I have a three pound average, I have a check. Period. It doesn't matter if I caught 17 fish. If I caught 17 fish and I had a three pound average, I got a check. For 100%. Period. Yep. Period. Doesn't Dude, matter was, what lake we've been on. I was thinking about you a bunch on Pelican specifically because that was an event i had spent just a ton of time on that body of water because i took a family vacation up there yeah um and i found a ton of individual big fish spots yeah i ignored every single one in that tournament because the schools were so right adam rasmussen like yep and just turns out it's like it seems like the, if the guy found if a guy like adam he found one to himself and yep. he blew the doors off but you had a hell of a tournament I and did. i'm curious were you back in the back in the stuff targeting those individual fish on like that random isolated boulder so it's funny and, you know because that door in my opinion was the one that if i'd have done things over i'd have had a one-two approach with them schooling fish and them single fish those big fish and when you talk about a five fish tournament i would have fished different so in that tournament a hundred percent so would adam yeah adam would have too that's yep. that's the key but i'll tell you this and and pelican pelican's an anomaly i don't know that we'll ever see a pelican lake again not like unless that. we go to pelican lake but even if we even went if back we do to it's pelican not as good lake, yeah Pelican so Lake, good. for those of you listening, Pelican Lake is a lake that we were the very first tournament that ever fished Pelican Lake. Yep. Pelican Lake is strictly catch and release and has been nothing but catch and release. Yep. So literally nobody fished Pelican Lake the way we fished it for a week and a half to two weeks. And there was no stone turned left on or left no. unturned. We will never see Pelican Lake again. I th I think they're trying it to shoot tough that day. And they're compared gonna, to what it like, it, I'm glad people didn't see what like it actually. Yeah, was doing. I think like, I, I think in their mind, they're trying to recapture the magic of Pelican with Big Stone this year. But we're too late. Big Stone, the magic of Big Stone is already. By the time we get there. We're going to be the fourth tournament in, and but anyways, I think you're going to see some big fish though. You're going to see some big fish, and I think it's going to be a grind, which I like. And we're going to dirty water, Matt. Yeah, like that. 
we've never gone to greasy green ass, dirty greasy ass water, have we? Yeah. Like the river's tannicky. The Vermilion's tannicky. Yeah. Pelican's kind of tannicky. We've never gone to a pure grease bowl, you know. No, no. It's a grease I, bowl. Uh, well, Tonka, you know, depending on certain. Oh certain yeah, areas you go in up Tonka, into Halstead. She gets pretty oh, ugly. Oh yeah, West but Arm and yeah. I, with Pelican, for me, just like everybody else, pre-fishing was stupid. It, it, it was. But I literally said, F this lake. This is a swamp. What? This is stupid. Shut up. I, it wasn't my cup of tea. What I, the hell? And, and here's the thing. I love Canadian Shield water. Canadian Shield water is my favorite kind of water. That's like for a million. Do you, were they, they, have, were they too small? Well, <laughs> they were so, huge. So here's what's funny. They were fucking big. Right? They set the hook on themselves. So I go home. I fished for two days. Yep. Caught a shit ton of fish. I go home saying, fuck that swamp. Right. Two days before the tournament. I'm like, well, I better go back up. And, you know, I only fished one side of the lake. Yep. So I go back up everywhere I go, catching two, three pounder, two, three pounder, two, three pounder, two, three pounder. I'm like, fucking, this is stupid. This is going to be, it's Lahamadu all over again, right? So I'm like, fuck this. I'm going, I'm going bass fishing. I'm, I'm going to see if they, I keep hearing there's giants in here. I'm done fiddle fucking round catching all these two three pounders if there's a big one in here i'm gonna catch a big one yep so i get on my electronics start getting on my map I'm like god oh, this looks pretty good i pull up to it first cast i stick one about six pounds yep literally turned myself 180 degrees made a cast as far away from that cast where i just caught that one and stuck another one that was almost six pounds Yep. Turned the boat a hundred and or ninety degrees, made a cast as far as I possibly could from it, and stuck four and a half pounder. Turned the boat ninety degrees, made another cast, and caught one almost five and a half pounds. And literally hit a waypoint and called Tony and said, Hey, I'm heading in, I'm done. And he's like, You've only been out here for like an hour. I'm like, Yeah, I'm good. So now it's tournament day. Yep. Right? No lake split. Yep. So I'm like, you know what? I've got a lot of fish in this area. Yep. I'm heading down to this area, and I had this spot, and then I had another spot that I had found that I was like, you know what? It's three things with each other that if they load up on it, a guy could sit there as long as he wanted to. Yep. I'm on my way there, and I see a boat on this one, the one with the three. So I pull into that, this other one, and I don't have any cell service. So I catch like four or five fish, but I got no cell service. So I got no idea where I'm at, right? My boat marshal keeps saying, hey, they, you know, it's not updating, not updating. So I'm going to go to this other spot. That boat's still sitting there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I drive by. Driving towards another spot, and all of a sudden she says, oh, hey, I got cell service. I'm like, where am I at? And she says, 43rd. Like, now wait a minute. <laughs> You're telling me I just had five fish hit score tracker, and I'm in 43rd? And she's like, yeah, the leader's already got like 47 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Right. Yeah. So... I go to the next spot and I'm pulling in and here's Tony. Now, let me tell everybody something about, cause I hear about teams and how people work together. I don't really? know how other teams work together and pre fish. Here's how like Tony, that. here's how Tony and I do it. We share travel costs, right? Yep. Our yep. hotel rooms. Yep. We share food. Yep. We talk about like, hey, I did well with a crankbait or yep. I'm flipping a jig. Dane and I are that way. Right? Yep. We do not, do not share spots. We do not 
share areas. Mm -hmm. The reason being is because I've seen too many friendships lost over that fucker took my spot. Right. Yeah. And I'll never. And and, uh, Tony, Tony's great with it. Right. We do not share spots. I'm pulling in and here's fucking Tony Hatton sitting on my ace in a hole. Yeah. And like now, how the fuck did Tony find that? And it was, he, that was his starting spot. On Pelican? Yeah. Yeah. And he's sitting in eighth place at that moment. So I said, good luck. So now I'm in. You're like, you're dead to me. Now I'm sitting in like 46th (laughs) place. So I told my boat marshal. I lost a friend. We're in 46th place. I told, and she's like, well, it's a big spot. I'm like, no, he's sitting in eighth place. And I know the potential there. He, He could win this thing off that spot. Like I gave him this spot. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, know, a, I, know, I, I was know. so pissed off that he found it too. But so. Dan, that was chan- that was Dane and I on the river this year. We started on the same spot. He was there first. He got the right boat position, and yeah. Anyway, go ahead. So now I'm now I'm pissed. Right. Right. Yep. Now You're I'm mad pissed. At him. And I told my boat marshal, I'm like, let's go win the Yeti. And I said, what's, what's big fish right now? And she said like a four and it was Kyle. Kyle had maybe even had a five. Kyle might've had a five pounder. I'm like a fucking five pounder. I'll be honest. I, I was surprised there weren't more big, big fish caught that day, but I know it's cause everyone stuck them in practice and it wasn't the best and, weather day. And I was know everybody was, most people had a lot of really big eyes during practice. I, I knew, I knew. Okay, you're you're an anomaly. When most people were telling me about all the sixes and sevens they caught in practice, those are the same fish when they hung them on the scale were going to be four and five, right? If they so, didn't weigh them, yeah. So I said before that tournament, five and a half pounds was going to win the Yeti. I could have told, yeah. Five and a yeah. half pounds was going to win the Yeti. Kyle had a five pounder. I was going to guess six. I said, let's just go, let's go lock up the Yeti real quick. And then I got to figure something out. And, yep. And, and she laughed. I had a gal. And she laughed. And like, oh, you're just going to go win the Yeti. And we pulled up <laughs> on a spot, that spot. And in back-to-back casts, I caught two five sevens. Damn. And back-to-back casts. And I was like, okay, from this point on, I am not doing anything but looking for four pounders. Yeah. And I said, we got a whole new game plan. She said, Adam's going to hit like a hundred and some pounds before the first half. I'm like, okay, so first place is gone. Yep. I said, you got two things. Keep in mind, Kyle Shuda had beat me by nine ounces at Vermilion. Yep. Shortly before that, I lost a boat to Noah Schultz by one pound, right? Yep. So I told her, I'm like, I got two guys I'm worried about. I don't care if we are in 50th, 49th, and 48th place as long as I'm 48th. Kyle Shuda and Noah Schultz. All I want to know is how many pounds I need to be ahead of them. Every time I catch a fish, you just say, you need three more pounds. You need whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I don't care what place we're in. I just want to know. And once they're behind me, you tell me the next guy ahead of me. Sure. Okay. We're on. So here we go. Now we're climbing. Now we're climbing. start targeting those isolated kind of single fish spots? Now I'm with loading up on these bill? big fish. So yeah, I'm not using that was the wide open. Bill. So here was, here, here was the key for me. Because we were all doing the same shit. Everybody was flipping jigs, throwing chatterbaits, throwing Texas rigs, throwing crankbaits. Uh, a little bit of. Cr- they weren't eating a crank. I me saw that guys day. throwing spinnerbaits. I guys yeah. uh, it, it, that after a week. Tube and a jig. Yeah. That's all I threw and a crank. So I thought about. I, I figured for sure a football jig was going to come into play for you. It was okay. Uh, in practice, more so than the tournament. The tube was my like. The tube was my saving grace gotcha. tournament day. I thought the plug and the football jig were going to be in my hand a lot more. but So I fished with a guy, Scott Walsh, yep. on Lake Vermilion. Yep. 
And Scotty's old school. Scotty is one of those. He's, you know, he's from that back school of the Capras, the Moinas, right? I mean, yep. he was a Silverado fisherman. Yep. He's old school. Yep. Round reel. Yeah. 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 So I'm sitting out with him on Lake Vermilion, and we pull into this big weed flat on top of rocks. Yep. Right? And I'm doing all your standard, throwing a chatterbait, throwing a spinnerbait, flipping a flipping a Texas rig in it, right? Yep. And I'm watching Walsh not just throw a crankbait, but throwing a, a Bagley deep diver, the, the, the two. B, B2. The, 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 the B2, which wait, dives 10 to 12 diving feet. Diving B2. Diving B2, yep. 10 to 12 feet. Yep, that's good. Good plug. And he's throwing it in five feet of water in the nastiest, gnarliest, fucking weeds you can possibly imagine and he's creaming them creaming them is he jerking it's got to look like he's jerking off an elephant or something (laughs) and i said why in the fuck would anybody work that hard and he said because nobody else will (laughs) right so i pulled up into all that nasty crappy slimy grass and sat down and took my chatterbait off. I took my jigs off. I took everything off the deck. And I put two crankbait rods on my front deck. One with a Rapala, uh, the Ott Slim 6. Yep. Good, and good the, plug. And the other one with, I, I want to say, so Tony had given me a Bagley, but I think it was the DB1. Yep. The deep diver yep. one. Yep, the smaller, right? the, the six six footer, Their six version of a DT6, yep. let's say, yep. right? Yep, yep. And I put those two on, and I start lighting them up, start lighting them up, start lighting them up. But literally, I'm like, man, I'm going to wear out ripping these baits. I'm in four feet of water. And the weeds are how, growing how tall? Like The they- weeds are within an inch of the surface. So I literally would fire the thing out, hold my rod straight up, turn the handle until I felt it hit the bottom and I would get two to three turns on that handle kunk, 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 before it mushed. And, and then if what? I, but if it was, kunk, kunk, it was kabang and I had one, huh? But if it mushed into the weeds, I had to rip it out of there, pull it in, pull the weeds off, do it again. Right. But all I kept hearing was cause nobody else will, nobody else will. And I kept climbing up that score tracker, kept climbing up the live well app, and I was catching big ones, yeah, right? And yeah. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't catch Adam, but I promise you I can set myself where nobody can catch me yep. because I'm listening, two pounds, three pounds. Exactly what I was finding is what everybody focused on. Right. We all did it. But you're targeting big ones. We all went and did two to three pounders because there were so many of them. So many. Right? And we all had in our mind, everybody knew they couldn't catch Adam, but nobody was willing to admit they weren't going to catch Adam, right? Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. except I knew that second place was easily obtainable. Yep. So, yep. It was the door was open. Yeah. And I knew I locked up the Yeti. I knew, I I knew that Moolah Cup, I knew I'd coming into that one, I was, you know, Arnie and Kyle were ahead of me in that one. I knew that going into it, but I'm like, man, there is no possibility that those fuckers are even going to be close to me at the end of today. No, if you, yeah, if you blast three big ones for yeah. that tournament, it's, yep. it's over. I'm like, I, it, yeah. it's over. Yep. It's over. That, that Moolah Cup is mine. The Yeti's mine. So now all I got is I need to beat Kyle and I need to beat Noah. Right. Right? That That is what I'm talking about with making commitments. Yep. Right. If you can make a commitment to yourself and you can honor that commitment at the end of the day, you won. You won. Yep. It doesn't matter if I didn't win. It doesn't matter if I'm in eighth place. Yep. If my commitment was to beat Noah and to beat Kyle and I beat Noah and I beat Kyle, I won. So that's your commitment next year too, is if I can beat Noah and I can beat Kyle, I might be angler of the year. 
No, no. So I'll be honest with you. So I, (laughs) it's funny because my wife, I think would tell you, I I manufacture, I'm kind of the Michael Jordan in the sense of I got to manufacture anger. I, I fish with a chip on my shoulder so much better than I do. Like fucking let's have fun. Good time, Charlie. (laughs) Right. When I've got that chip on my shoulder, Uh I'm, I'm deadly. So I'll manufacture somebody pissing me off. Like literally, okay. I might be like that fucking Aaron Teal stepped on my shoe, uh-huh. and I know that motherfucker knew he stepped on my shoe. Never said a word. I am gonna kick the shit out of Teal at this next tournament. Yeah. I don't care if if I'm in 49th place as long as I'm 29 pounds ahead of Teal. Right, right. I'll right. manufacture that chip on my shoulder, and it was real easy at the beginning of my Champions Tour career because. So the very first tournament I fished was Minnetonka. I didn't get the invite. That was invitation only, Yep. right? I wanted nothing more than to fish the Champions Tour, but who am I? I didn't get an invite, Fucking right? Fucking musky fisherman. And I, yeah. yeah, and I did everything I could trying to fish this qualifier, fish this qualifier, and I kept coming up short. Arnie yep. beat me at Whitefish. Brad yep. beat me at Waconia. Yep. You know, I kept coming up short, and I'm like, son of a bitch. So then I get the call. And I believe it was Jim Moyna that couldn't make it for Tonka. So I got his spot. I, I believe. I don't know for sure, but I got somebody's spot for Tonka. So there I am. Walk into Fletcher's, and literally, people are, like, laughing their ass off about what the fuck is the musky guy doing here? What are you doing? You know, are you running a camera boat? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm, and I'm talking about people that I consider friends think this is a big fucking joke and they're making jokes about me like i'm not even there right? just right to your face yeah and thank god for donators there's a there's a you know Whoa. bunch of money and oh oh yeah so i literally who's a I donator went, now motherfucker i went home and said i don't give a fuck gotcha i don't give a fuck i am not going to embarrass myself yeah, I'm not going to embarrass Scott Bonima for inviting me. Yep, but I am fucking because uh, Scott told me if I was in the uh, top ten, I got an invite the next year, automatic invite. That's... If I made top six, I made it to the championship that year, right? So I'm like, I promise you, I promise you, I'm coming out of here in the top ten. Period. There is no fucking way. And I have never, now keep in mind, at that point in my life, I had thrown a bass bait on Lake Minnetonka maybe seven times, right? Got it. But been fishing muskies there for 30 years. Yeah. Caught, how many how many bass have you caught on a cowgirl? Oh, my God. Well, keep in mind, <laughs> when I was really hitting muskie fishing hard, that I, I was not a cowgirl guy. Most of my muskies have been caught topwater simply because of the TV aspect of it. I needed good TV. Yep. So yep. The old we, pacemaker? We pacemaker. Don't know when they were wood. Jackpot. Yeah. So anyway. I, I knew exactly where I was going to go. Yep. No sweat. But then I'm thinking, yeah, it's Champions Tour. Yeah, I need to catch a ton of fish. And I don't think I can catch a ton of fish on these musky spots, right? Right. Yeah, I'm like, not. But I've watched all these dickheads fishing docks. That's got to be easy, right? I've never fished docks. How hard I'm could like, it be? How hard could it be? You skip a stupid worm under a dock and you catch a bass. Yep. So there I am. And... First off, I realized that I am the absolute worst dock fisherman that's ever been known to man. And on Lake Lake Tonka, where they already don't like you fishing their docks anyways, no, no. some jackass ringing the bell all the way down the row is not... Making not, a little bit of noise? Yeah. Causing a little ruckus? But I'm catching fish. I'm catching fish. And I'm right there. I'm sitting in 10th place, 5th place, 8th place, 7th place, 6th place. And I'm like, this is... I, I got it. But then we get to lunch, or we're just before lunch, and and here comes tournament director, right? And the whole interview, the whole interview is the anomaly and how fun it is that the musky guy is here, right? And immediately, immediately, there's that fucking chip on my shoulder again. Like, you know what? Eat a dick. (laughs) 
<laughs> Eat a dick with your, oh, the musky guy's here. Oh, is he throwing a suet? Ha, ha, ha. Right? It's good lure. So I'm like, you know what? I, I said to the kid, I'm like, what's leading big fish? He said, a 413. Like, it's not even a five pounder. Right, let's go catch five pounder real quick. And he laughed and said, oh, you'll just go catch five pounder. And we pulled up on the spot. And literally my first cast, the fish came out of the water. And my kid who had said about nine words to me all day said, that's the biggest fucking largemouth bass I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and it was, it was, a, you know, it was a big bastard, but I lost it. I made another cast and I caught a five, four. So we won big fish. And, but so we came in at lunch and everybody's like, oh, Jesus Christ. Somebody, somebody caught a five pounder. Somebody like the, came to play today. Simple. Yeah. I, I said, let's go catch five pounders. So I did. You guys fish here all the time. How come you didn't go catch five pounder? Right. And that's where the chip started. Gotcha. That's where it started. I had a guy this here at the river. So your, your deal started with like, fuck you. I'm catching a five pounder. My deal started with, I'm not going to embarrass myself. Yep. I'm never going to embarrass Scott Bonima. Never. For inviting me here. Yep. Right? I got to make sure that everybody who says, what the fuck is he doing here? At the end of it says, fuck, why wasn't he here? How come he never got an invite? Right? That, that was my goal. Mm -hmm. What I came out of that tournament realizing was dock fishing, not my forte. <laughs> so bad. So Were bad. Were those twins on a dock, though? Those big <laughs> ones? You like... No, picked out a five no, that was, dock quick. That or? was on a that was on a hump that I bass were always a nuisance when I was musky fishing, but they were always big ones. Nice. So yep. I literally pulled up on it. There wasn't a boat within sight, and I stuck two stuck two and two casts. So, huh. and yeah, it's pretty much one of those spots that if any, if I ever needed a kicker fish, that I'm pretty sure I could run there and stick a kicker fish. Yep. Of five. Yep. So I I don't know that I could catch a six there, but I know I can catch five there pretty much at will. So, but one five usually doesn't do much for you, but when you're just well, looking you can get to win some the threes Eddie, and fours to go with it yeah. nowadays. I'm but what's weird bold. is you never catch them there. It's like, yeah, it's a weird spot. But All of those spots on Tonk are weird like that, I feel like. Yeah. So this year, remember what I said, damned if I do, damned if I don't now. So this year, I don't win the Yeti at one of the tournaments. Yep. Right? Now we got a new big fish king making a big deal, strutting around Mr. Peacock, right? Oh, there's a new big fish king in town. Remember what I said about manufacturing and anger? Yep. I told Tony, don't care if I don't win them all, but I will beat him at every tournament for the rest of his series on big fish. <laughs> I don't care if it's one ounce or one pound. He will be behind me by big fish at every tournament. So and I that, manufactured anger and I won three Yetis. Interesting. I so, fish better mad. Do not look at Matt Thompson wrong the night before a tournament. He might just whoop that sweet ass. No. No. No, and you know what's funny is, is I, I, I got no desire to get in a fist fight. Nobody likes getting punched in the face. No, I meant you know? on the, I meant on the court, on the yeah, field, I, on the water. Yeah, it, it's not. But what's funny about it is, and, and I'll use. They they meant nothing by it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure. I, I mean, and, and I'll go back to Michael Jordan when you hear everybody talk about him playing basketball he would create these stories in his head and be mad at who he was playing right oh that guy said this about me and does this and he did this and you hear people talk about like man i didn't even i've never even shaken hands with michael jordan right you know <laughs> right right so all these guys they, they never meant anything by it yeah shit i'm i'm probably the biggest dickhead there is making jokes at people's expense right i mean it just for me what i figured out was hey i'll just harness I'll, I'll bottle this up put it on the fish and at the end of the day no fuck it hand yeah. me a yeti cooler i love it hand they, me that yeti 
they talk like Gerald Swindle talks about like PMA, positive mental attitude. I yeah. feel like yours is more like POMA, pissed off mental attitude. But it's not. It's truly not. It's just it's one of those things where I've got a it, you pick a target, right? And I manufacture that that anger at that target. I, like I said, I'll use Noah Schultz. Yeah. Man, there is nobody, nobody. The year Noah won the boat at Bay Lake, I literally, when I was a pound behind him, I felt so bad because I knew if I caught one more fish, I was going to slam the door and there was no possibility of him winning that boat. And there I was feeling so bad because there was nobody that not only deserved to win that boat, but needed, needed. There, there was no, you, you, you hope he needed to win that boat or he was not going to be back the next year probably. So like you, you made a commitment in your mind to let him win at that no, point? Or? No, no. What I'm saying is, is there I was feeling bad yep. that I'm going to beat this guy. And I went 45 minutes and never caught another fish. And he beat me. Right? So I'm done feeling bad for Noah Schultz. Well, for what it's I worth. I promise you, Noah <laughs> Schultz wasn't feeling bad about if he was going to beat me. No. Nope. <laughs> and I'll be honest. Like, I wasn't feeling bad when I got the lead back and I caught a three pounder and I've right? never caught just one fish on this spot. And I proceeded to go 25 more minutes without a fucking bite. I went 45 minutes at Bay Lake. So I was running almost a three and a half pound average at that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which oh, my closest competitor good. had like a one pound, eight ounce average. Yeah, that was just not a big fish lake, so that's pretty good. I was creaming them. Yeah. It, it kind of one of those. I had a pattern. Yep, and you ran And I was it. creaming them. Yep. And the best thing that happened to me was the wind. Everybody else was all worried about the wind. The wind, man, I was so focused in and kicking ass on that wind that it was. I, I felt like I was unbeatable. You needed the wind. Yeah. The wind died, right? Never dawned on me, hey, the wind died. Better change what you're doing. Just kept grinding away. In 45 minutes, I'd have bet my fucking house I was going to catch another three-pounder yeah. in 45 yeah. minutes and go home with a boat. Right. Right? Right. I went 45 minutes and never had a bite. Never had a bite. Now, in that same 45 minutes, knowing in, in hindsight, no one ever caught a fish until one minute left, and he caught like a one-pound eight-ouncer or something like that. And it was over. But I promise you, if you would have bet anybody in that tour, the way him and I were fishing, that with 45 minutes left, neither one of us were going to catch a fish. Right. Now, in that 45 minutes, you had James Linder and John Figgy, who were absolutely rocketing up the, the leaderboard. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and that is not two names that no. you need to see. Mm -mm. You know, now for me, I, once again, I'm like, I could care less. Right? right, but I promise you, Noah. Noah was quivering. Noah was sweating. Oh fuck! I guarantee it. But as good as I fish, angry. If you put pressure on Noah, worst thing you could possibly do. Holy that guy smokes. responds to pressure so amazingly well, dude. It, I think the more he's jiggling, right? The more he's shaking, the better he is. I watched the goal recap and like it sticks in my mind that last when he's skipping docks. Right. And it's so fast and automatic. It's and at robotic. one point the jig hits him in the face. Yep. On the way back. And he's just like He's robotic. It's like it didn't even hit him in the face. No. You know, and th at that point I'm like, dude, have you ever seen Beer Fest? Yeah. You yep. know when when the guy yep. has the eye of the Jew, and they and they immediately put him to the to the back of the the boot line, like I do. that, like oh god! With all respect for Jews, that is Noah. Yeah, you know what I mean. Everybody's got their eye of the tiger out there. Eye of the tiger right? is a much better analogy. <laughs> I everybody's got one. I 
you know, we all, if you're, if you're at the level that you're at fishing the champions tour, yep. you, you obviously got skill, right? Yep. I, I mean, we all laugh about like, I, I, I am I'm by far the shittiest dock fisherman, but fuck, I can cast a bait caster like nobody's business, right? Yeah. yeah. We all have skills, right? The key is we all have a spidey sensor. We all mm -hmm. have that fish bone. Yep. Right. Can you, can you hear it? Can you listen to it? And do you take advantage of it? Right. When your spidey sense says get the fuck out of 30 feet of water and go to the dock. Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. Did you listen to it? Noah lives off his fish bone. He doesn't care what he's doing. He doesn't care what he loves to do. Yep. He doesn't care what he hates to do. When his fish bone goes off. Yep. He listens. All he cares about is what he has to do. He, I don't and even think he contemplates what he has to do. No, no. It's he, just, I, well, I guess it's time to go fish a dock, right? Oh, docks are on, and he literally switches gears, and it's, I'm going to fish every goddamn dock on this lake, right? Yep, yep. So it's, they, there's, there's reasons why Matt Peters, Noah Schultz, yep. have won multiple champions tour events multiples yep. yep anybody can win one you really can yep right anybody can win one we all have had that pattern that day that whatever yep. anybody can win one yep there's a reason matt peters and noah schultz have won multiples and have won multiple angler of the year right right it's because they are that dialed in to their fishbone they are right. Yep. They yep. don't, they shut out the outside world. They don't care if they're one pound behind or one pound ahead. Yep. Right. They know what they got to do and they do it. It's just fact. plain and simple. Fishbone says, do it. They do it. Noah's won a lot of different ways. Like Bay Lake, he's one sitting on a spot for long periods of time and soaking it for a bite every 20 minutes he's won banging docks he's won throwing a rig and a square bill for smallmouth like he's that to me is is the epitome of dangerous is when you can do that many different things and succeed and that's it's hard because a lot of anglers want to do that right but then it's like well own your style but it's like okay well, if I own my style, I'm still going to lose to Noah Schultz because he can do my style, his style, and his style at a flick of the wrist. You that's, know what I mean? That's the that's what I tell you about Kyle shooting too. Same, Kyle, yeah, yeah, not when, just when Noah. Kyle hits that groove, so Kyle's still new to this yep. format. Well, bummer. he's almost won major tournaments down south. Like right, you watch him in Missouri in those Highland Reservoirs. Yep. He holds his own. Yeah, that guy consistently. But my dark horse. My mm -hmm. dark horse in this thing. When I talk about the guys with multiple mm -hmm. events that can do it all yep. and listen to their fishbone and do it is Connor O'Connor. Yeah. Connor O'Connor has won more Wenzel comeback awards than right. anybody I know because you've never seen anybody who has, well, I shouldn't say him and Will Papa. Will <laughs> Papa are the, the heckle and jide. They're the king of two halves. Yep. Right? Yep. God forbid either one of those two guys ever figure out how to put two fucking halves together. Right. <laughs> because they will absolutely be unstoppable. With what they do in the half that they win the Wenzel from, if they did that in the other half, they would have set records. Right. Weight records. Yep. I mean, you're talking about guys. Will did 80 pounds in a half. In a half. Right? That's pretty good. <laughs> I'm telling you. Willie. Connor O'Connor and Will Papa are two guys you better not ever sleep on. Like, I don't care what they did in the first half. I don't. Especially if they had a terrible first half. Because they're both coming out swinging for the fucking fences in the second right, half. Right, right, right. Noah, you better never sleep on him. I don't care what he did at the Any river. tournament. I don't care what he did at the river. Now he's, he's good mad. at the river. But you know what I'm saying. Now he's mad. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
He had a hell of a second half on the river. Kyle Shuda. I don't care where we're going. I yep. really don't. I don't care where we're going. Now, Andy Nichols. Andy Nichols. Nichols. Or Nichols. I'm sorry. I've always called him Nichols. He'll forgive you. He's a good dude. I, the guy is literally one of my favorites on the tour. Oh, he's the nicest dude ever. It's not even just about being nice. He's one of my favorites on the tour because I... Andy does well, he what can catch Andy him, like straight Andy, up, and he does what Andy wants to do. Andy, Andy doesn't does Andy. care. Andy doesn't care if you are killing him on a drop shot. Nope. Andy doesn't want to throw a drop shot. Andy doesn't throw a drop yep. shot. Andy yep. does what Andy wants to do. I love that level of commitment that Andy does what Andy does. I fish against Andy for a long time. He's from around here, and Andy's always been dangerous oh. and he does him his own style he finds his own stuff he doesn't he just a he's a pure angler he would be my outside pick for angler of the year like if somebody dude, said give me your can, dark horse because he's always right there dude five killed. fish every fish counts yep. he he does it both he does them both really but good. he's such a good man his dad yeah. is possibly Mike? one of the nicest men Great, dude oh my god the, the other one that I would Did say. Did you catch him today, Aaron? Yeah. <laughs> Mike is such a good dude. Oh, God. The other guy that's the only thing that's holding him back is that they haven't stopped us from pre-fishing, that they haven't cut us off. Oh, yeah. If they ever put a cutoff on yep. where the lake sat for a week. Yep, and you couldn't touch it. Arnie Helgerson. Interesting. Yeah. And the reason I say that is look at. Lakes that are notorious dock bites. Look at how good Arnie still does. Yep. Even after a week of every Everybody Joe shit the one, rag man, man sticking every fish underneath those docks. Yep. Arnie still comes back on tournament day and blasts those fish. Right? It's true. God forbid that lake ever gets a sit for a week with nobody touching it. I'm telling you. Arnie would Dude. be, look at what he does on uh, when we cool. get to lakes like Gull, the whitefish chain, right? I'm not even going to talk. We shouldn't even talk about the Gull thing because it was cool. Yeah. And I think it was. Hunter Went's going to be a scary, scary. I, I'm Dude, telling you. There's ya. a lot of young, good anglers like Hunter. Hunter's a great angler. I mean, there's a lot of them. Like, uh, oh, on, my God. That, He's uh, one of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, the River. Uh, Novak, Parker. Uh, Parker. Tommy yep. Parker. Yep. Right? Tommy Parker is, the, the kid's got skill. He does. Jacob Novak. Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny. It's funny that Jacob Novak's kind of the old man veteran now of the kids. Yeah, right? he's like the kid of, he's like the, the dad of the kids. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he's, I mean, Real there's good. another guy that's always right there if you yep. could just put two halves together it's like oh no well it's a weird sport like it's such a double-edged sword of a sport and it's that's where good anglers i think in the champions tour can really and just in tournament fishing in general they can find themselves in slumps and i've been there it's because your your sword is double-edged and if you start to think about it or change the sword because it burns you because it's double edged and you start to you start to just the problem force is, it. The problem is with this format is and you just said it without saying it. It's the mental. It's hundred percent. The fishing didn't change. Yep. The fish did not change. No, the we, fish are still the fish. The spots are still the spot. You're just a crackhead now. You were relaxed usually when you fish the spot, but now that there's a score tracker and a marshal and freaking your mind going a hundred times Arnold faster Arnold Helgerson's than it usually in does. first place. The docks must be on fire, and then right. you find out that Arnie was sitting on a rock it's reef offshore. over 25 <laughs> feet of water. That's so right? funny. Yep. It's like for Christ's sakes that that mental game. Yep. That's the reason that guys like Connor O'Connor. Impre and will Papa impress me as much as they do is because anybody can have a really good first half and then fall flat on their face in the second half. Yep. 
they consistently have a miserable first half. I'm talking miserable. You didn't even know that they blasted off. Yep. And at the end of the day, they're getting a check. Yep. Right? They impress the hell out of me because they can clear their head at lunch yep. and start over. That is the one thing I like about the lunch break. It's about the only thing is I love it's it. a new half. I love it. It's not enough time it's a new for game. me to retie. That's my only complaint, like, just while we're talking about it. Stop making that much of a mess in the first half. I'm sorry. It, it happened. And uh, <laughs> now I need to fucking pick up the shambles and try to make something out of my second half. And you're calling me over to a meeting and I have another fucking three liters. To tie. So stop making such a goddamn mess in the first half is what I would tell you there. Uh, I, uh, th- I'm learning that. I, I'm learning that. I don't know that any of us can fully appreciate how lucky we are. Oh, dude! I, mean, I wasn't bitching no, when no, I no, said that but I mean, because not even it's have, the best thing there is to do. But not even to have that halftime split, but to get treated the way we do at yeah, we that halftime fed, fed split. And, yeah. I mean, I, we're not eating some crappy Snickers that's soaking wet in my cooler. I mean, right? I'll be honest. I don't do their lunches justice because I'm too damn anxious half the time <laughs> to eat it. Well, I but. eat their lunch. I I, eat can, the hell. I usually eat two three lunches. I'm not gonna lie to you. I, see some people for any eat boat more when they're out there that may not have gotten a lunch. I'm probably the fat ass that ate your lunch. So. When I'm anxious, my stomach knots the fuck up. That's really? my problem. Yeah, I'm like one of those. When guys. I'm coming to eat your lunch next time. I force it down, but I don't like it, and I'm not hungry, and I'm anxious usually uh, on break. I normally don't yeah. retie shit. I normally don't worry about a single thing i eat i kick back and i mean yeah you just got a five pounder i would too I, one, <laughs> yeah, I, to me it is what it is i don't change a single thing i make the commitment what i'm gonna do and i'm gonna do it what if it doesn't work the first half you don't change dick you just you gotta go- be willing to come in last place well, I understand. If you're going to fish my way, you got to be willing to come in last. Place. Got it. So you're you're live or die. I'm live or die. You don't adjust. I don't adjust. So, huh? And, and I'm, I'll use Vermillion this here. Yeah. Right. Remember what I said. I've come in second three times. Yep. What I've always heard about me is if I could ever figure out how to catch some smaller fish. Right? Yep. Oh, man, you pad a couple of small ones with what he's doing, he's fucking unstoppable. Right. Right? Yeah. So. Bang a couple more docks each yeah, time. Yeah, so we get to Vermilion. Pre-fishing. I'm having the best pre-fish on Vermilion. I, I cannot tell you how many five-pounders I caught Dude. pre-fishing on Vermilion. That practice for Vermilion was the best practice I've had for a tournament in a long time, and it's one of the worst tournaments I've ever had in my entire life. I have, and I know exactly why. I have fished for a million Dude, for two thirty years. It's fucking nuts. I feel pretty confident that I can go catch five pounder on a, on any given day. Yep, on Lake Vermilion. Well, that's that makes one of us. But I mean, I have never had it that good in practice. So I and I'm watching this bug hatch. It's yeah. coming. Oh, it's yeah. coming. It's coming, and I'm live or die off the bug catch. Like, I love the I bug do, catch. too. It's my I deal. I love it. I was ready for it, too. So now I'm like, okay. And I have my wife up there over the 4th of July. Yep. And she's watching me catch five after five after five. <laughs> she's like, oh, my God. You, you're you going to win this thing. I'm like, well, here's the deal. I got to find some fillers. And she kept saying, why? Why do you care? Stop listening to everybody else. Fuck them. Literally, that's that. My wife is my greatest supporter and my biggest critic. She right? sounds wonderful. She literally was sounds like, "Sounds like a jam." Fuck them. Fuck yeah, them fuck and that. their fillers. That's the <laughs> dumbest shit I've ever heard. And I'm like, "No, Kelly, I'm telling you, I got to do this." And you know, fuck that. 
You're yeah. catching. You're I, big I just, motherfucking She's like, I just watched yeah. you catch two five pounders in back to back casts. Do that, right? Nope. She leaves. Now I'm focused. I got to catch, I got to find fillers. So I'm playing the bug hatch thing. I find two flats where I'm like, okay, I can catch a lot of one to two pound fish here. Yep. Here we go. Tournament day. First fish I catch is like two eight. Next one I catch is like three pounds. I told my kid, I'm like, it's time to swing the bat. We're going to drop a bomb on the board right now. And I'm going to make it fucking real clear to everybody here today. They can't beat me. And he was like, well, and I'm like, I'm not kidding you. I'm going to make it real fucking clear that I'm winning today. You made it pretty clear. So I literally pull up to a spot. Second cast, I catch four and a half pounder. Two casts later, I stick the six pounder. Right. And I told him, I'm like, that's the shot. Across the fucking, right now, everybody knows it's over. It's over. I just caught a four and a half and a six in back-to-back cast. Nobody's ever caught a six in one of these tournaments here. Not one. They all know they're fucked. And he says, you're in first place. You're in first place. You're seven and a half pounds in the lead. Yep. And immediately, I go from tough guy, fishing angry, got the chip on my shoulder, to... If he could only catch fillers, he could win these things, right? Now, remember what I said? I just put back a six-pound fish. Yep. I caught a four-and-a-half and a a six-pounder in less than five casts. Yep. You got the devil, Paul Newman, on one shoulder saying, if you could catch fillers, that'd be great. And then you got, like, your wife is the angel on the other. Fuck that. Yep. So catching big ones only. I put back a six-pounder strap my rod down, drive to a spot, and fish for an hour and a half to catch three between a pound and a pound 12 and fall to fifth place and never recover from it after catching a four and a half and a six and five casts. Never even made another cast where I caught a four and a half and a six pound fish. I I feel no sympathy for you. I will never. I don't care. I I will never not be who I am ever again. You shouldn't. No, I learned something there, and I appreciate that. But I have no sympathy for you because every time I casted a goddamn hair jig that day, my leader fucking broke, or my shit. Like, I wanted to throw a hair jig so bad that day, dude. It's ironic to me because you have no clue. I'm a bait caster guy, man. I yeah. like big braid. I like big. I like big round butt bass. I right? was a hundred percent committed to a crankbait and a jerk bait or and a hair jig. Like, if it's windy, they're gonna eat a crankbait. If it slicks up and they quit eating a crank, I'm plocking a hair jig in my hand. And every time I picked Problem up the hair jig, crank. I broke it. Problem with that crank is you couldn't catch one over four. In practice, you could anywhere you wanted. Not over four. I, could. I couldn't. I could. That's all. I was catching just. But here's big what's ones. what's funny is is it didn't. I didn't worry. So coming into lunch, being in fifth place, I was pissed yeah. that I gave that lead away. Yeah. Big time. But it was also in practice. I murdered them on the west side. The majority of the biggest fish I caught in practice were on the west side. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it doesn't matter. We're going to win this thing. Yeah. I, I literally I had zero fear of winning it. Zero. I, That's I, how if I you felt going told me, into it. If you would have told me I was 25 pounds down, it wouldn't have bothered me one bit. Not one bit. It did tournament day, but going into the tournament, if you just said, Teal, you're going to suck today, I said, I would have said, dude, you could tell me that any day. Today, no. it is not possible for me to suck today. I'm going to fist fuck them today. Yeah. Like that's my men- that was my mentality going into Vermilion. It just fuck just my first three <sighs> spots on the west side, everywhere I had caught fish over four pounds, I couldn't buy a fish over two pounds. That lake is changes. And did it, yeah. You just so the lake changes. It did. But did you change or did you just I tried. I, I tried too late. 
so I figured out too late what had changed. Yeah, sure. So it was, so in practice, your classic isolated boulder, right, wasn't the key. No, it wasn't. <laughs> no. is a wind deal on freaking current. On, in that second half, isolated boulders outdid everything else 10 to 1. Yeah. Attention all smallmouth anglers. Have you thrown the marabou jig? Have you thrown the hair jig? Well, if you have, you're going to want to listen right now. This podcast is brought to you by Veselka Fishing and Customs, a custom rod shop based out of Minnesota, and he has developed the answer, folks. What if I told you you could throw that marabou jig 30 to 50% further than you're casting it right now? Well, the well, Dane, Mr. Veselka himself, has developed the answer. It's a custom 8-foot hair jig rod developed on a steelhead fly blank. He's put custom fly guides on this, so you're really going to be able to outcast the competition, catch more smallmouth. They aren't going to see you. What more do you need? Here's what I need you to do right now. Visit VeselkaFishing.com. That's V-O-C-E-L-K-A Fishing.com. This is the eight-foot hair jig rod, but this guy can build you anything you want. If you can dream it, he can do it. This episode is brought to you by Just North of Memphis Barbecue. This is world champion barbecue. If you smoke meat and you don't like good barbecue, I do not know what to tell you right now besides you need to try some of this stuff. They've got their rub. They've got their sauces right on their website. They've got their famous dry rub award-winning seasoning that you can put on ribs, brisket, pulled pork, chicken, wings, anything you like to put on the smoker, on the oven, on the grill, any meat you like to cook. You need some of this dry rub seasoning in your life. But don't forget the sauce because that's award-winning world champion sauce here. No matter what flavor you like, they've got three different sauces and they are all good. You can drink them straight out the bottle. We've got Sweet Christie's for all you sweet loving barbecue folk. We've got Christie's Mischief for all you spicy bass anglers out there. And then we've got Christie's Gold and they'll sell all three of them in a combo but you need to go to their website right now it's jnomemphis.com that's jnomemphis.com dry rub sauce barbecue let's go but it didn't dawn on me till too late Got it. and by the time it did it was no i couldn't catch up i couldn't come back to it the guy who won practice the least amount that tournament yeah. Which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's that's my mantra is fuck practice. Yeah, I am curious about <laughs> that. Do you have any uh like rituals with practice and how yeah, you approach these it. events? Don't well, do yeah, it. Well, yeah, you don't stick your five pounders a day before, I'm guessing. Do you even <laughs> practice the day well, before? <laughs> I don't. Uh not because not You because don't of, practice the day before a tournament. Wednesday I don't. I Ever. Don't. No. I do. You have to be the only fucking human. So that I'm does. saying that this year I threw my boat in a couple of times on Wednesday, but I really, I never went anywhere near a single thing that I was going to touch on tournament day. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. But normally I never put my boat in the water on Wednesday. And the reason being is the one time I did Lahamadu, the very first year of being able to fish the champions tour full event you had to be off the water at noon yep. right for yep. media day yep i'm literally right across from the access i'm fishing a dock i'm talking to this guy standing on his dock and i see him do the right the look at his watch move and i said hey what time is it and he said 11 58 <sighs> and I called Paul Newman and said, I'm going to be late. There's no way I can have my boat on the trailer in two minutes. I yeah. can't. And he's like, well, why are you calling me? I'm like, because uh, I'm late. Yeah, you right? turned, you're being an honest guy. So 
I get to the landing, put the boat on the trailer. Arnie's there. Yep. Arnie already got his boat on the trailer. And I see him look. Now, Arnie doesn't know me from Adam, No, right? Arnie's looking at you like. That motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Right? So we get to the meeting, get done with the meeting, and Newman says, hey, by the way, Matt turned himself in for not being off the water at noon. He's starting tomorrow with a half-hour penalty. Right? And I'm thinking, now keep in mind, this is only, so Lahamadu was going to be the second Champions Tour event I've ever fished, but it's my first year fishing the circuit. Yep, right? yep. I'm thinking a half hour. What the fuck could happen in 30 minutes? Right. Right. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> 30 minutes wasn't from blast off. It was 30 minutes from lying in the water. So everybody blasted off. Oh, okay. Then I got to sit there and wait for 7 o'clock and everybody to start casting so that I could blast off at 730. At 730, when I blasted off, Matt Peters and Figgy had almost 50 pounds. And Matt Thompson never practiced for another tournament again. I said I will never fucking put my <laughs> boat in the water on Wednesday ever again. It's like four if now. I, <laughs> if I can't be done by Wednesday, I got no business being here. But it's like four o'clock now. Yeah. Just well, call it noon for you and you're yeah, good. I just, it, it's it's my rigging day. Hey, that, it's my peace of mind day. I laugh and say, well, at least I won't, at least I don't have a half hour penalty to start tomorrow. I think you should, you should think about two days before. That's me being a little selfish going into next so, year. But here's, they asked me. So uh, this year, let, let's talk about this here. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah. So it's weird because I didn't change a single thing about me this year coming into the year. Yep. It's not like I reflected at the end of last year and said, okay, here's what I'm going to do different. Filler, right? filler, filler. No? Filler. So I started this year exactly the same way. There's two guys in this industry that, and there's a lot of guys in this industry, but like Joe Carlson, I'm fortunate enough that my best friend is also the, the Skeeter rep and right. My, my foot in the door was Skeeter. Yep. But he's also my best friend. Yep. But the guy who put both Joe and I where we are is George Little, right? Legend. And I look around the Champions Tour at 49 other anglers other than me, and literally there's three, four guys on the Champions Tour that don't owe their fishing career to George Little. Without George Little backing them, they wouldn't be where they are, right? George brought them into the industry, into Ranger's family, right? Now, he can't keep you there. It's up to you to keep yourself there. Right. But having George bring you to the table was such a feather in your cap. Mm-hmm. George, George sees... And this has never changed about George. George sees talent in people that they don't even know they have. Right. Right. He, he's able to spot talent and see things. Joe Carlson came from the plastic injection mold. He was a plastic injection mold designer. He's a tool maker yep. by trade. Yep. Guy's one of the greatest boat salesmen you'll ever meet in your life. George recognized that in Joe and brought him into that industry. Sure. Right? I was always the the clown, the fun guy, right? But people never, I mean, it was also like, hey, if you're going to be the life of the party, do you really need the life of the party? What about when he's not? Right. right? George gave le me legitimacy. Sure. George, George saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. And, and, and I can use everybody that I know. Fish in the champion store. He saw something in everybody. Absolutely. Right? Yep. The other one is Tim Price. Sure. Tim Price from Encoda Humminbird. Same exact way. Right? Yep. The guy just, if he believes in you, there's nobody better to have in your corner. Absolutely. 
both of those guys this year. Yeah. Out of nowhere, George Little at the river. Out of nowhere, before we ever made a cast at the river, said, you're my pick this year for Angler of the Year. And I laughed. And he didn't laugh. Looked right at me and said, no, I'm serious. You're my pick this year for Angler of the Year. And walked away. And it was so stunning. It, it literally, uh, just saying it, if you can feel the goosebumps. I, I, I mean, feel them. So when we got done at the river, and it didn't, you know, I didn't think anything of it, but we get to Vermilion. Get another fourth place, right? Able yep. to come back a little bit after that shithole debacle. Idiot. Now I'm sitting in first place. Never been in first before. Never been in that. Normally I get to just go be me. I get to swing for the fence. Because once again, if I don't do it, who the fuck cares? Nobody expected anything out of me yeah, anyway. So I'm the musky, musky guy. guy. He only catches one. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's just going to win a cooler or nothing. Yeah, no, he's right. Yeah. We, one guy, one bass. That's yeah. all we need to worry about. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. So now here I am sitting in first place for, to me, the most prestigious award in fishing in our state. To me, the champions tour angler of the year. Absolutely. Is as big as we've gotten the sport of bass fishing in the state of Minnesota. It's not, it, it's bigger than the championship. Yeah, it, okay, you won the boat. To to be Angler of the Year against 50 yep. of the best fishermen in this state. Yep. And, and the reason it, it dawns on you that it's that big of a deal is look at the guys who have won it. You got Noah. You've got Peters. Peters. Yep. You got John Figgy. Yep. And Shooter was probably second or third every single time. I, I believe close. he's been up there. I don't know how he hasn't. Won I believe he's yet, been. But. Well, it's only his, last year was only his second year on tour. That's crazy. So, dude, he I came, have to peep just before we okay. get too too far. When when I went off on my little tangent on that other podcast about the Berkeley flatworm, I I could see Andrew was looking at me like. Shut the fuck up. Dude, they sponsored this fucking podcast. Right? <laughs> and, I loved every second of that, dude. Oh, I loved it. And they thinking, loved it. I was thinking, uh, Omni Attacko must be like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> 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 we sell a lot of flatworms, dickhead. <laughs> yeah, it's really good smelling shit that falls through the water. Oh, that fucking Max scent. I, I, I believe in it. I don't know, man. The scent. Yeah. But the products... Are the biggest pieces of shit I've ever seen in the water. That four inch general on a jig worm, I do like that. If you're jigging it, I don't move it. But it, it looks dead. Remember, it lays on its fucking side. Dude, bass will eat a laying I, that, piece that, of shit. Awesome. They love yeah. a laying piece of shit. Well, it's real obvious the way they eat that <laughs> thing because they do. They choke the shit out of that thing. But you throw like that Z Man stuff, and now that's a piece of shit that fucking. But it stands up. Yeah, dude. It stands. It's a floater, baby. So, and, and I mean this, and we'll, I'll get off on a little tangent here. Those are allowed. I You're in am. The galaxy. So I I think it's real obvious that I I march to the beat of my own drum, right? I think so. But I'm a guy who. Like I said, I pay attention to everything, every detail, every fucking detail. I sharpen bass hooks to the point where if you looked at them wrong, your eyes would bleed. I respect that. Okay. I'm the guy that before he ever throws something in a lake has spent so much time with it in a glass of water or in the tub or in my sink. Really? I know what that bait looks like before it ever touches a lake. Yep. And I know if it's going to be in my boat or not. Yep. So every bait you test in your kitchen sink? I do. So 
It's funny because, so when we used to have the actual media day, we used to all get put into the same little area. So we all sat there tying all our rods and rigging, watching everybody like, well, you knew what everybody was. Well, there you go. It looks like I'm watching James Linder rig up seven drop shot rods, you know, <laughs> it's a couple. <laughs> it's like, well, it's pretty obvious. Right. So I'm sitting there one day. I think it was it was before Pekegamo. And I've got all my Z-Man baits out, and I'm rigging up my Ned rigs. But I'm taking all my Z-Man out, and I stretch it, and I snap it. 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 And I'm knocking all the salt out of it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And quartz. Here comes quartz from across the room. But how stupid this is. And what a retard. And why would you do that? And blah, blah, blah. And I'm explaining it, that it stands up. Now, now I got James Linder leaning over my boat, and we're and I'm showing him. And he says, that's ingenious. Because the more I use the bait, the more fish I catch on it, the better it gets. And that's exactly what's happening is they're chewing and knocking the salt out of it. So, and how I discovered that was in the stupid glass of water. Because mm-hmm. not every one of them, when I would pull it out of the package, would float, mm-hmm. right? Some would sink. Some would sink slower than others. Some would stand straight up. Every one that I ripped the salt out of stood straight up, right? Mm-hmm. So there's there's little things yep. that you start. that, and, and I've always said this about fishing. Any dickhead can catch one big fish. Any dickhead which has been proven five times. I've lost the Yeti five fucking times, right? So obviously any dickhead can catch a big fish even, on a given day. Even this dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you. Yep. yep. But the key is, can you duplicate it? Haven't yet. Can you back it up? <laughs> can you back it up? TV, doing TV for muskies was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because TV, a camera that's running on you 24 hours or for that eight hours, Yep. it saw every cast, it saw the light change, it saw a cloud come over the top of you. Yep. When you stick a fish, it's time-coded, right? Yep. Because we shot everything live action and we shot everything top water, you were looking at the baits. You saw the conditions. You saw everything. What it also allowed me to do was figure out, and here's the biggest key, water temp, time of the day. By taking the time of the day, I was able to go back and look at majors and minors. Mm-hmm. Every day you got two minors and two majors in every day, mm-hmm. right? So if you ever look at me on the boat, and it's been this way since 1999, in my back pocket of every day, there's a book in my back pocket called John Alden Knight's Solner Tables. And every day I know the majors and the minors. And every day in our tournament time, I'm going to have a minor and I'm going to have a major. And I promise you, I will be on my biggest fish spot during either that major or that minor. And I can show you 10 yetis that were caught during a major or minor. Gotcha. TV muskie fishing taught me things that I never would have picked up any other way. That's freaking cool because now you're sitting in the studio yeah and it's like hey i caught that fish at 3 30 in the afternoon what the hell was and you open up the solner tables and it's like well son of a bitch we were 40 minutes into a major right right you know i got a question for you on that yeah while we're talking about it so like to me the major minor feeding period to me applies the best during consistent weather the only thing that will trigger what a major or a minor feeding time is to me is pressure fronts and and weather 
I mean, have you noticed a difference in terms of, okay, like to me, pre-front, right? Pre-front is when your school fires or, but that, that, or is that fish so, bites. Not, see, not for you? No. No, 100% because that's major a, minor. Yeah, that, that is completely, that's what we all have at our disposal is pre-fronts, barometric change. Well, we all right? have the solar lunar tables at our disposal, yeah, too. Yeah, but guess what? I Nobody's check it. using those. I look at them. Every day? Not every day. No, but like before I go fish a tournament, I understand when I want to be on my juice. When you're practicing, do you know that you caught your biggest biggest fish in practice on a major or a minor? I don't live off of it, no. And That's, most people don't live off the solar, solar lunar tables, which is why I was kind of asking about that variance because, You've fuck. got, so here's the deal. Every day you've got weather change, right? Yep. You got barometer you Sometimes it's wind. sunny and 75 all day yeah. with a five mile an hour wind. And that's those days, in my opinion, where major and minor play in the most. But, but that's your only advantage. Otherwise, the only other advantage you had was dawn or dusk. Right. 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 So if I can add two more bite windows to my day, because I'm only going to get either dawn or dusk. Yeah. And in a champion's tour, I'm never going to get dusk. No. Nope. And I'll be honest with you. Dawn is historically and it's never changed it doesn't matter if it's hunting or fishing mornings suck for me i hate morning interesting i hate morning the only time i don't mind getting up in the dark is to go deer hunting or duck hunting going fishing in the dark in the morning is as dumb to me as masturbating into a condom well yeah because I'm going to be honest with you, any fish that you can catch at five, I can catch at 10. Interesting. I don't need to sit out there and kick a rooster in the ass to catch a bass. But huh. in saying that, I am digging myself out of a hole at every goddamn Champions Tour event because every one of you guys knows how to catch a fish at 7 a.m., and I don't. I, I don't never, always. If you look at it, I never catch a goddamn thing until at least 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. 7 a.m., you would wonder if I blast it off. Interesting. But if there's a minor, I'm in. Catch and, them. And this year at Vermillion, anybody that wants to look at this, we had a minor on tournament day at 8 o'clock a.m., and at, by 8.07, I had a six-pounder in the boat. So you practice for those. So you kind of I'm, – I'm picking this up a little bit. So you practice those major minors. So, you, like, tournament day. I drove 11 miles to make five casts. Wow. Okay. That's – got it. That's the difference of fishing for a 50-inch muskie or a muskie. Right. That's the difference of fishing for smallmouth bass versus I'm going to go I'm going to go swing the bat and drop a 5 pounder on the board right now. I'll be honest, I hope everyone's fucking listening to that because I've been listening this whole time and just had that aha moment of the practice part too. Like you freaking know where they're going to roll up and eat during a major or a minor because you practiced it that way and it happens again. At that time, at that place. What anybody who's ever, huh. we all have a favorite lake, yeah, right? Our favorite lake has our favorite spot because we consistently catch big fish there, right? If you pay attention to it, you're always at that spot at the exact same time at the, from the exact same angle, right? A big fish spot is a big fish spot. What you have to figure out is when they're there yeah. to use it because they're not always there. Right. A big fish spot isn't an always spot. No. It. So with musky fishing, you either had low light or you pray to God you had the right conditions all day long. What a major and a minor did was give you two more chances throughout the day. Instead of having to wait till 8 o'clock for dusk, I may have a bite at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 
that, God damn it, this fish might slide up on top of this thing to eat. Right, 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 right. right. And I would run 30 miles, 30 miles to a fish that I had raised a day before, two days before. The other thing that TV allowed me for, and it's forced me to incorporate into bass fishing, is water temperature, right? How often does that fish feed at this water temp? Because big fish don't just sit there and, and gobble all day long. Right. If you look at their forage, they may only eat three times a day, right? Mm-hmm. But they're going to make it count. When you when you pick up a big fish and you can feel a, a two-pound something in its stomach, that's been there for four hours. Right. You've been working on that thing for four hours, right? So what you figure out is they eat a whole lot different in 65-degree water than they do at 87-degree water. Sure. Right. Then they do as soon as it's and, and once now you start putting those things together. OK, we've got a cold front. Yep. Right. We lost three degrees of surface temp. That fish, instead of feeding every six hours, now may be feeding every eight hours. So the major is going to be my only chance to stick that fish. Sure. Right. This spot, if I can't be here on the major, so if I get the lake spit and I can't be on that spot in the major, it's out. I, I'm not going to go fish it just because it's in my lake split. Sure. I'll find something else. So what do you do not during those times? And is your confidence level like just ramped up during those times and to the point where you look back at your marshal and be like, hold my beer. It, uh, and it's funny because... I, I believe this. If you asked 10 of my boat marshals yep. that have been in the boat when I caught the Yeti, all 10 of them would say, he looked at me and said, let's go win the Yeti. And drove, not, uh, drove, started the boat, drove to a spot, shut the trolling motor down, and within four casts won the Yeti. So every tournament, you know, you can look at your marshal and say, Let's go win the Yeti at least twice, 10 minutes before every major I would major say once, minor. In, once. That's so cool. I feel that way once a day that I feel like no matter what, I got at least one spot on the lake, no matter what the lake split's going to be, at least I've got one spot that I can hit during that time that I can stick a Yeti class fish. That's what I practice for. Sure. I practice for that bite. I practice for a TV moment. Gotcha. I love it. I have a question. So I've noticed you hold your big ones like a muskie. It's is there some like you hold it by all of a sudden, all of a sudden, like it's terrible. What like what makes you do that? Why don't you hold it in the lip? I don't even pay attention to it. You I'm don't? not even paying attention to it until after the fact, and I'm like, oh, you, you fucking retard, dude. dude why did you decide to hold, to hold them that way? Is it a musk? It's like, oh, this one's a musky. So I, I never thought about it until. <laughs> so at Lahamadu, I caught a seven and a half pounder on Lahamadu. Jesus. Now keep in mind. I I just assumed everybody caught six, seven pound fish on Lamadou. I didn't know any, any different, right? But everyone else who's, did. <laughs> but I will tell you this. Anyone, I don't care if they've musky fished with me, bass fished with me, walleye fished with me. When I've got a fish hooked, I am the absolute shittiest judge on this planet of how big a fish is. I will tell you, you could have a 50-plus inch muskie on, and I'll say, yeah, that fish might go 45, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I stuck that bass on Lahamadu and went to boat flip it, and my drag slipped, and my drag never slips because I lock them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they don't slip. I free spool everything. I don't ever use my drag. I, I just from the musky world, I, I free spool. Yeah, you feather them. 
Yeah. Yeah. I literally click, freeze spool, click, right? Mm -hmm. It's just what I do. It's natural. It's not, it has nothing to do with the reel. The reels can have the greatest drag known to man. It's just, it's natural habit for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I reached down to grab that fish, when I realized I couldn't boat flip it, not a clue why, hand went into the gill plate, right? Came up with the fish, did my deal. I have no clue why. So I rarely bend over to pick up a fish. The only time I'm ever reaching down to pick up a fish is when I go to flip it in and I can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And for some reason, it's just natural for me to end up with my finger in a fucking gill plate. But I'm telling you, there's nobody that hates seeing his fish pictures worse than myself because it looks like I'm trying to make a four pounder look like it's 22 pounds and it's has nothing to, I don't, I don't like having my picture taken. I cannot fucking stand taking pictures with fish. It's, it's not my favorite. 50 either. inch muskies. Mm -hmm. I could care less. I'm, I'm not going to look at it. It's a little one. Anyway. I'm not going to look at it. Right. So I, I don't need a picture. It, it drives me nuts. But I get it, Champions Tour. I, oh, yeah. I understand 100% why Scott's doing what he's doing, right? Mm -hmm. For the people back at home, they want to see this shit. They're excited. Oh, my God, Matt Thompson just caught a six-pounder, right? They yep. want to see it. Yep. What I despise is when they see it and they're like, somebody teach that fucker how to hold a bass, please. Because <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. So Man. it's not it's not something I think about doing sure you can see if you look through my galleries it's real easy to tell the fish that i won the yetis with because they're fish that i literally laid down or knelt down and grabbed and i'm holding them exactly how i grabbed them right right by that stupid fucking gill plate everything else i've got exactly like you should hold a bass because i just flipped it up and i grabbed it right mm -hmm. by its mm -hmm. stupid fat lip right yep for me, after all those years of grabbing muskies, it's where my hand normally goes on a big fish. It just, I cannot break the, it's like I said, free spool. I got $700 bait caster reels that have the best drags known to man, and I'm still free spooling fish, right? <laughs> you used to hate bass, though, back when you were a muskie fisherman. You, I, I thought I'm sewer trout. Yeah. And you said like the funniest analogy on that uh, other podcast you were on about the dandelion or something. Uh, well, it's funny. It's funny because I used to, you know, I, and once again, it's not that I gave muskies all the credit like, oh, they're, well, they're the smart fish and I'm, right. I'm better than everybody else because I fish for muskies. It was all these fucking rednecks talking to me about bass like they were the most magical creature on earth. It's like, it's not a fucking unicorn. It's a largemouth. Some some fat ass mowing his lawn on the side of the lake shot a fucking dandelion out the back end of the mower. He hit the water and a bass ate it. Right? Let's not put any magic to it. It's, but in saying that, put some money on the line. That's where it. That's where that changes. Put some goddamn right? money on the line. That's when people talk about bass as, as a grass carp or anything. Yeah. It's like, that's fair everything's a grass carp until you put money on the line well and i look at it so like smallmouth bass to me smallmouth bass are unicorns i fucking me. love those things so from may memorial weekend until mm -hmm. the end of june maybe that first week of july i'm like every other fucking hero Right? Oh, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm a big-time smallmouth fisherman. It's my fisherman. least favorite time to fish for them. The second those fish leave the shallows and go become smallmouth bass, I am the biggest idiot on this planet of how to catch a smallmouth bass in a spot that I can't see the structure. I need, if I can't visually see really? what I'm casting at, I am the worst smallmouth fisherman you will ever find. Do you fish largemouth deep? Do you fish deep much? Or? So it's, I think one of the coolest things that I've discovered in the last two years now is 
the open water. So I'm I'm fortunate enough living in that Anoka, Chisago County area. Mm-hmm. We've got some amazing lakes that have deep basins to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Phenomenal shallow water structure, but deep basins where the fish just stack in suspended schools of bluegills. Gotcha. And the chicken jig. That oh, yeah. stupid chicken jig. Stupid fucking chicken. Has become one of the funnest possible things. It's I, fun. So two of the biggest fish that I've caught on Champions Tour, I caught on chicken. Nobody knows that until at this now. moment. But you want to cut it, it out or leave it? No. In? No. Right. So it's it, it's funny because let let's I hear this all the time, too. Well, what are you throwing? Like seven, eight-inch swim baits? What are you throwing? Right, right, right. You throwing so, bulldog, one-pound bulldogs, two-pound so bulldogs? Biggest, the biggest bass I've ever caught in the Champions Tour, I caught on a uh, seven-inch swim bait. Really? Yep. I did catch on a seven-inch swim bait. I, I literally just I was going for broke and said, uh, I'm going to need a Like I said, I started almost 50 pounds down. So in my mind, I, every fish I need, I better be catching had to be four pounds or bigger yeah right so that was lahamadu yeah yeah and i was on carlos and in in practice i've found some big fish on Those. carlos i ain't gonna talk about it but yeah yeah i believe you so i yeah seven inch swim bait is what i caught that fish on <laughs> cool um the chicken jig <clears throat> has a five eighths on one and a half ounce on another. One of them over twenty eight feet of water. One over thirty one feet of water. Wow! And running the bait, probably less than six feet under the surface. What? Okay, so what? What? You're fishing. What is making you do that? Like what? What brings you to 28 feet of water, five feet down? Because you're a mega 360 guy. You're not. You're not a forward-facing guy, and that to me is such a for like all of a sudden I'm fishing a weed line and I'm paying my live out, and all of a sudden there's these big blobs. You ever look around bluegills? You ever look around though when you're fishing all and the time? See all the little blip, blip, blip on the surface? Yeah, yeah. It was one of those. Yeah. You ever cast it that blue blue every time? Yeah. Not a seven-inch swim bait. A lot. <laughs> or do you just make one quick cast at it and then go right back to what you were doing? probably uh door number two yeah and and i was always that guy too until i forced myself it's kind of like a ned rig i took an entire an entire three weeks fishing two of my favorite lakes in this state where i never set a rod on my deck other than my ned rig and i forced myself to fish the ned rig and I'm not saying I do it right to find something for me where I believed in that Ned rig as much as I believe in another bait, right? And at the end of that three weeks, I had caught three fish over six pounds. And literally got to the next Champions Tour event and won a Yeti on the Ned rig. So you went from seven inch swim bait to Ned rig in the fish size. I'm a guy that when, if I decide I'm going to learn how to do something, yep. I'm going to learn how to do it until I feel like I can kick your ass at it. I love that. So ah. I don't do a lot of things. Yep. I really don't. I don't do a ton of things well, but I do a handful of things that I feel for me I'm doing exactly what I need to do. Sure. Sure. I love that. And we've all felt that magic when you find that stride with a bait or with a technique or with a style where you just feel unstoppable uh, around any lake. You're like, I could take this fucker all around this lake and I can catch him all day. Here's the other side of it is I've forced myself to do that because of the fact of I also know what my weaknesses are. And it's one, because I refuse to learn how to do it, but schooling fish, schooling fish are not my game at all. 
open water or the the. Why do you refuse to do it though? Why do you refuse to learn? Because I you, hate it. I yeah, hate it. Well, you seem like a guy who would hate the Ned rig too. Yet you spent three weeks with it. So I don't. Like, so it's I because of the way I fish it. I put it somewhere and I leave it there. Yeah. So when I make that cast, I believe that big bastard's sitting right there, and all I got to do is wait him out because I can be I can out stubborn that fish. I love that technique. A stupid weed line with 35 fish that as fast as you can get to them kicks my... I, I, I can't you can stand. catch all 35 of them with the same technique. Can't That's do what it. I'm saying. Can't do it. I, I, On Tonka. Weed line fish. You can so do that. I, Connor, I, I fished with Connor O'Connor on a weed line. And if you ever want to really, really get humbled fast, right? You go do something that, yeah, I'm okay at it, right? With somebody who's really, really good at it. Yeah. I went down a weed line with Connor O'Connor, and he flipped a jig, not doing anything magical. And that dude outfished me 12 to 1. 12 to 1. And it was... Such a moment of futility for me that even when I went back to fish that same weed line and realized that I couldn't even stay on the weed line the mm -hmm. way that he did it so effortlessly, just motored down this weed line and put his jig in the right spot with every every toss, right? That I was like, okay, you got one of two options. Either this has to be my Ned Rig moment where I'm going to spend the next three, four, five weeks doing nothing but flipping a goddamn jig on a weed line. Or you say, this shit's off my list. And for me, I cross it off my list. Now, had Connor caught a Yeti fish? <laughs> but I don't see. <laughs> the I, truth comes out. Well, no five pounder? I ain't doing problem. it. Here's the problem, and I mean this. Five pounders don't live on I weed lines. I don't see these weed line guys coming in with the fish. They, I, I don't see it. There's I, certain lakes it happens, and I agree with you. There's a lot of lakes it doesn't. I think, <clears throat> and this is me, the biggest fish that you're going to catch in that tournament is going to be under seven feet of water. I agree. On most lakes, most of the time, I think a lot of the biggest fish, aside from smallmouth, Cisco chasing ass smallmouth, yep. I agree. The biggest largemouth in the lake are probably going to live shallow and on I'm not most saying, bodies of water. I'm not saying you got to live and die off shorelines. I'm not saying you got to have docks, right? Docks, docks are the the weirdest. So I'm a hardcore believer that if I'm catching three pound fish in a spot. Uh, I'm never going to catch a five pounder in that spot, sure. right? Except for a fucking dock a, or a, a smallmouth wintering hole. <laughs> but a, a dock is the the Forrest Gump box of chocolates, right? right. You, you never know what, what you're going to get. get. You, yep. you just it's literally the the ultimate Forrest Gump box of chocolates. Yep. The I'll only call her thing, grass for free. <laughs> the only other spot or thing now that I'm finding. I'm having that kind of what the hell success is a school of bluegills over 20 plus feet of water. Interesting. Where one cast I might catch a three pounder and the next cast I catch a six pounder and the next cast I catch a one pounder and the next cast I th a three pound pike, right? It's like every little, it, yeah, it is. It's the short bus of the lake. You don't know what's on that on that bus. Right, right. You have no idea. Not a clue. You nope. might have a thirty-five-year-old Mongol that's you know yep. three hundred and twenty pounds, and some kid that's you know two foot tall. Hundred percent. So. Yep. Yeah. I have a problem. I broke the seal. We don't do question and answer. This is just us talking. But I made a few phone calls <laughs> before this one because oh, I I know there's a history. You with didn't you. call my mom, did you? No, no. Um, she, they, they, I would have. Those would be some of the funniest stories you've ever heard, I promise. I believe it. And uh, you know what? 
the galaxy is far and wide, so this might not be the end of this. So, uh, I got a question for you. So, what's up with you blowing up six hundred dollar musky rods with Paul Newman and <laughs> in a tournament on Leech Lake on a tournament? Yeah, what's up with? I heard you blew up some really expensive rod in a tournament on Leech Lake. I got to hear, dude. About I didn't it. just blow it up. I, it sounded literally like. Uh, somebody shot Paul Newman with a 30 odd six when it went off. So <laughs> we were fishing the Muskies Inc. International Tournament. And it was Joe Carlson, Paul Newman, and myself. And of course, and I say this about Joe all the time I, I've fished walleye tournaments with that guy, I've fished muskie tournaments with that guy, and I've fished bass tournaments with that guy. And if you're in the boat with Joe Carlson, you're in the money. Plain and simple. Got it. The guy, if he ever decided to not have a job and just be a tournament fisherman, he would be scary good. So we're in the international tournament. Joe Carlson has already got us in for the boat. That's the only reason you're fishing that tournament is to just. Well, Newman and Carlson, they're like, we got we got the musky ringer, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And. We're going, we're floating across this spot and there's about a 47, 48 incher floating dead. That's, and I, when I say it's floating dead, I mean, it's like a roll of paper towels dead, got right? It. I yep. mean, this thing's got the bugs on it. Oh, It is, you can smell it coming across the lake. It is bad. And Newman, Newman for being a farmer's probably got the most delicate, nose and stomach of any farmer I've ever met in my life. I mean, normally a farmer could club a kitten and while he was eating a sandwich, you know, and yep. not think twice about it. <laughs> so it was kind of one of those slow motion, epic moments of everybody staring at this fish. Newman's gagging kind of. <laughs> I launch a bait out, reel it nice and slow, lines coming up over the fish, and I drive it into this thing with everything I've got. And my rod literally absolutely explodes about eight inches above the foregrip, and the fish explodes at the same time and lets out the most noxious stench you can possibly imagine. <laughs> and now we've got a problem because the bait that I've buried into this dead muskie for some stupid, I still to this moment couldn't tell you why. It's, we couldn't do anything right. with it. It was just I had to fuck with it, right? <laughs> hey, do you want to see a dead body, right? I had to fuck with it. I had to touch it. I cannot blame you. But I got one of my favorite baits buried in this thing. Yeah. And I'm not leaving this bait behind. And Joe's like, you're out of your fucking mind. You can cut your line right now. We're not going anywhere near that thing. And <laughs> Newman's in the back doing the why, why, who, who, why, who. <laughs> why would you do that? I don't get it. Why? <laughs> and I'm like, hey, just get over there and let me get and. Joe's like, hey, go fuck yourself. You no, know, <laughs> I'm not going over there. And I'm like, hey, we're in my boat. Right. This isn't a, you know, an, a debate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's my goddamn boat. <laughs> I'm going to get my bait. And yeah, so I, I got it back. But yeah, it was pretty, pretty written in stone that from here on out, anything dead is off limits. Like you don't look at it, don't touch it, don't don't fucking just leave it alone. So yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, you got up there, ripped your bait out of the fish. Oh, dude, I, I'm telling you, Newman puked was, over the side. I and... had the the most Bassmaster Classic hook set you have ever seen, and that rod just absolutely exploded. Just, I mean, there was no hesitation. There, was, it was just a cup. Boom. And graphite flying. Splintered. Splintered like you cannot believe. 
Wow. Yeah. Never, never broken a rod on a hook set in my life except for driving it into a bloated muskie. It had the last. It did. It the did. Last. And, and just so we're all clear, that, that bait never got used again either. It, it, the, the stench would <laughs> not come off of that thing. It literally, it was, yeah, it smelled like a dirty vagina washed by a dirtier <laughs> vagina. So, <laughs> it was I think so, I just peed. Oh, my fucking God. It was God. so bad. So, yeah. I'm hoping that's the uh, epitome of our question moment, but I'm guessing. No. You you used to run with the ranger folk, and I, I heard I heard about, okay, I heard about some sales training down in Arkansas. I heard about some sales training, some dry counties, oh, God. some boxing rings. Oh, God. Um, and there's, like, one other thing. Oh. Uh, Uh, I heard it got a little rowdy at sales training. Oh, you, you know, care to elaborate a little bit? Well, yes and no. There's there's some things that just uh, if you weren't there, it, you 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 can't know. But Tad, everybody knows Tad. Tad Johnson. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Tad fell in love one night at a bar. And with a with a woman that I'm pretty sure she felt like she was probably in love with Tad too at the moment, but the uh, 16 guys that she was with were were not a fan of, of any of this going down. Okay. So we're all having a good time and living it up, and suddenly I, I look and Tad is literally, I mean, it's like, something right out of a movie. These guys are all circled around Tad. And and Tad's like one of the nicest guys on earth. Absolutely. But I'm pretty sure he, Tad could hold his own if he needed to. I wouldn't fuck with Tad. No. But I don't know how well Tad was going to do in this scenario. I right? mean, you're down in Dixieland and you're a damn Yankee. Yeah. And I didn't know Tad from Adam, but it was one of those things of, well, fuck it if we're gonna do this let's do this and yeah i came in hot <laughs> oh so ted ted and i both got out of there we got loaded up into a vehicle and driven back to flipping arkansas <laughs> ted was ted was in love and i was ready to fight but yeah neither one of us got what we wanted that night completely so tad's like so Tad's got a Southern Bell over his right shoulder, and you got a bunch of, you yeah. got a bunch of wild hillbillies so, ready to take uh, this the, guy out. Like what the hell? Yeah, you ain't from around here, and then are you? So there. So now, now I'm all in. Uh huh. And thinking, you know, let's do this, Tad. Right. Except that Tad used this moment, like, well, here's my chance to get away with her, right? Got so it. now it's me. Just you. And he's running out the back door. <laughs> with the Southern with, Bell. <laughs> with the Southern Bell. Going so, to get yeah. some sweet tea. Yeah. Mother of God. So no, like I All said, right. we uh, we immediately got loaded up in the <laughs> in the family truckster that would haul us around a, a bunch of drunken idiots from the dry county to the county where you could drink. <laughs> we would all get thrown into this old Tahoe that okay. only had... So you had a passenger seat, you had a back seat, and then the rest of it was wide open. And you would stuff as many of us in this open hole in the back yep. as you possibly could. George Little I driving? Mean, or No, no. I, George George would always somehow exit stage left before, before, that we, before the Tahoe got yep. loaded, right? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah, Janet, pick him up. Good, George, cool. George was smart enough to George know is... that no good is going to come from me being in that fucking Tahoe. That's a fact. Yeah. And he and he was always right. Always George, right. I mean, he's, he's, that that he's same a wise bar, That same bar. It, it, and you got to remember, when you're in flipping Arkansas and you're in a dry county. You got and, damn flipping Arkansas. Well, and you're, you're working for basically the Pope of flip in arkansas you're goddamn right if you're gonna go do unpopish things 
I don't know. You got to flee, right? Yep. So we would flee. You go to Mountain Home. We would go to Mountain <laughs> Home. And that bar, I'm telling you, was the biggest fucking it, it, it take everything you know about the South, put it into a fucking snow globe and shake it up as hard as you possibly can. <laughs> Then cut a whiz into that snow globe and puke on it. And that was that bar. Because literally, you'd walk in there and they'd have chick boxing, let's say. What? Right? Oh, yeah. Chick but, boxing? But let, me, let me explain what chick boxing in Arkansas is. You've got two gals that literally could kick any man's ass I know. Oh, yeah. With the tiniest boxing gloves on, absolutely beating the living bejesus out of the out of each other in the center of a bar that the DJs jamming, you know, you got and some dude in little boy shorts and glow sticks dancing and two chicks just stomping the living shit out of each other. Is that is is that kind of what you were hoping to hear? <laughs> so you guys like got some dick sucks, got the fuck out of there, and no. uh, went home. Or? No, and it's <laughs> it's funny because you know, it, it's I guess it's one of those deals when when you're not looking for it, that's when it shows up, right? I would always 100%. be. I I always had somebody at home. I was I was the last thing I went to Arkansas for was looking for uh, something to do, right? Mm-hmm. And. Yeah, I I cannot tell you how many opportunities came out of Arkansas, but they were the most inept, shittiest, crappiest, scariest, nightmarish opportunities I've ever seen in my life. And I mean, from boxing chicks to floor fucking dudes who passed out in urinals to that's who if I was going to get lucky, I that that was my opportunity. I've always so. said like like I like I don't know if I'm gay. I've never tried it, right? I right. think like you can say that maybe you're just not. I yeah, I I I think it's safe to say that when I've got a grown man grinding on the floor in front of me, it's not not my game. Not Can't, my not, not my, my bag, baby. Not I, my bag. I did I never thought, you know what, toss me the keys to that Tahoe. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> so Hand me the glider. Speaking, but, <laughs> yeah, like talking about I, I, the weird shit that we would do, or the fact that we never, ever should have become employees of that company, right? They called us the Fun Bunch. There was Dave Bentley, <laughs> Joe Carlson, and myself, and we were absolute fucking stand back. Shit's about to, I mean, literally, that it was like a crowd of people would just watch. What are these three idiots going to do, right? It's, it's funny because I've been fortunate in my life that I can, I can do things and say things that should get me punched right in my big fat lips that people laugh, throw their arm around me and say, I want to hang out with this guy. Right. 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 And, and it's one of those things that it, it's a gift. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm extremely fortunate to be that guy that right. people don't want to kill. They want to hang out with. You have a lot of like awesome, awesome blessings, a lot of awesome things to be thankful <laughs> for, dude. And it's good that you, that you are, I think a lot of like learning to be thankful and grateful for what you have, I think is, is oh. really hard for people. And I think it's probably like the number one thing that, like helps with happiness helps with with all that stuff but I, like so dry counties you're drinking in a dry county like are these are these like they call them speakeasies right no you got to leave you there's gotta like, leave the county to even have a beer but there's like clubs i heard about i heard about so these the, you can these buy a club. membership membership yep what the fuck's that about you got to buy a membership if you're a member you can drink in a dry county. In a dry county. Okay. But there was only one place, and it was <laughs> the restaurant that had literally, I'm not kidding you, they would put their Christmas tree up upside down. What? This is in that flipping 
Flippin Arkansas yes. area. Yep. yep. We're, no, ra- we're Flippin Ranger and Vex. Where Rangers Flippin. were and are made and Vexes yep. are made now. Yep. Yep. Shadows fall on each other. Right. I mean, literally. Yeah. It's. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I've been down there, man. Oh, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> some Hatfield and McCoy shit down there uh, with it's, that. And you know what? Not even. Not even. That's that's their boys' territory, and they made sure they built a factory you right know what, there though? to do it. But. That is, and I think there was a lot of people that said that was an arrogant move, right? That wasn't arrogance at no. all. That was, that was Forest Wood. Mm-hmm. You're goddamn right, dude. And Randy Hopper. Yep. Randy, you, you got to remember, Randy Hopper is as integral of a part of the Ranger boat happening as f- as far as, I mean, he's been there since day one. Dude, he's the only guy who can build a boat from start to finish with his bare hands. It, like, out of clay no can, in mm-hmm. his garage. The dude is a genius and he a is. legend, and he lives in the shadows, and he likes it that way, and it's and amazing. Keith, Keith has always been for his grandson, mm-hmm. but he wasn't for his grandson. Keith, I, I think people thought Keith got handed everything on a on his silver platter. Fuck no. Keith had it probably worse yeah. than anybody that worked at that plant. Literally, that, you can guy's, tell. that guy's probably still picking fiberglass splinters out from under his fingernails. You talk about a chip on your shoulder? Yeah. That dude walks with that dude lives with a chip yep. on his shoulder. And I've he noticed should. that. He should. Because nobody ever gave him the credit that he earned it. It was always given to him. But Right, because he always because everybody the, assumed he was given everything yep. and he's like, Fuck you, that's not me. But it how wasn't it went, you to know? me it wasn't arrogance at all for them to build Vexus where they did. It was where else would they have built Vexus? They totally. built they built Ranger where they did. Why wouldn't you build Vexus? where you did these are your people these it's your are, land yeah yeah you it, it's not like you had to do something extra dude it's a legacy it. it's a dynasty it's a. Uh, it 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 runs deeper than if people Forrest could ever realize to build a mcdonald's he would have built a mcdonald's bingo it's deeper it runs deeper than people could ever 100 percent realize no that's down uh, there, man it's in their blood and it's 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 it runs a lot deeper than than no, meets the eye i give them a, a ton of credit because you know they say well they cherry pick no they didn't cherry pick they took they took the talent that like i said they have a gift they didn't cherry pick. Ranger walked them out the door, and they were unemployed. But like, it was they just like you look at you look at the people that made that company, right? That are now making. I I, I tip my hat so much, not just to Randy and Keith, but to every employee Absolutely. at that factory because they didn't know what the hell was going to happen i mean there's no guarantees in this world well i mean do a lot of those people jump factories down there so it it is like not it, the it's people a diff- that came to vexus arbuckle uh, yeah. arbuckle uh, no not not like the core group <laughs> yeah not i'm not talking about the core group yeah i'm not talking about the core group no i uh i tip my hat to him but yeah it's that's, unbelievable that 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 experience of those years spending that time in flipping Arkansas is, man, it's, I'll, I'll never, ever be able to replace those times. It's ever. a special place. I've, I've been fortunate to spend some time down there here the last couple of years. And it, you can tell there's a little bit of magic in the air, so to speak. And there's a little bit of aura, oh. aura to it, so to speak. Um, George. So when we first started do once we kind of left the Bell Arco, yep. right? It used to be at everything at the Bell Arco. Like yep. literally, George would do his entire hospitality at the Bell Arco. Okay. And Senior would, George would always do a big pheasant fry, right? Because sure. you're in Arkansas, so everything's got to be deep fried. Whether it's a fucking green bean or a pheasant, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It gets deep Chicken fried. Chicken fried steak, baby. Right? So Senior, if it was raining outside, would literally take the hotel room and just newspaper everything in the hotel room and fire up the deep fryer right in the middle of the hotel room floor. Damn. And I'm talking like where grease was dripping down the walls. Wow. And he would fry 100 pounds of pheasant breast. Damn. Right? To feed everybody. Wow. 
when George moved it all over to Gaston's, it was like moving to the big house, right? Dude, now Gaston's all of a sudden, is, holy oh fuck. yeah, Gaston's now, is like. Woo, I mean, we went from baby. We here. <laughs> yeah, we went from the hood to the yeah, hotel, right? We're not in Kansas yeah. anymore. And don't get me wrong, I love the Bell Arco. Some of the funnest times ever. But Gaston's, it was like, it was a whole new world. And at that time, we had replaced Bentley with Quartz. Got it. Right. Yep. And now Quartz is an employee. Yep. <sighs> soft air, <laughs> soft air guns. Right? Oh shit! The ones yep. that shoot those six oh, millimeter uh, yeah. hard Airsoft pellets. Guns. Yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so we roll into Gaston's. Joe Quartz and myself, armed to the teeth with these airsoft guns, <laughs> and we take every opportunity that we have to unload on each other. Right? Oh my so god! Every day, every you guys day, are ruthless, dude. Every day we're you make me up feel like a bitch. We're showing up to our meetings and every day with red welts and shit on us, <laughs> right? And every chance we get, we're whacking somebody that probably doesn't deserve it. So the rule was, the rule was no fucking face shots, right? No face shots. So one day, Quartz, Quartz and I get in a little gun battle, right? Yeah, a little pistol. And he runs into his hotel room. And I'm like, son of a bitch. Right? But he's hiding behind his hotel room door. And I stick my, the, it's cracked, right? At, yeah. The, at the hinge. Yeah. So I go to peek through the hinge where the fuck he is. And I'm going to shoot him through there. And he fucking unloads right in my mouth. <laughs> through, the, the, through the crack in the door. Now, like my lips aren't already fat enough. I literally swelled up to the point. I, I looked like some African bush chick that puts the plate in her lip. You know how that status symbol. I swelled up looking like that. Now I got to go hang out with the big boys. Right. And I'm looking like I've got a dinner plate in my lower lip. And courts cannot stop fucking laughing. So the, the moral of the story is, is that George took our guns away. <laughs> we were we were grown men and we, we got our we got our guns taken away from us. <laughs> but fucking courts couldn't follow the rules. Shot me in the mouth, sound bitch. You guys, we uh we need those guns. Oh yeah, there, no. And when How'd George, go? when George comes to you and says, "When George says, give me the guns," <laughs> you you don't say what guns. It's not the, 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 this isn't. We're not going to sit down and talk about this. Hey, do, no, even. we're not going to do it anymore. Literally, you had three grown men walk to their hotel rooms, get their shit, and bring it back and <laughs> hand it over like uh, no sweat, no sweat. Here you are. And to this day. I, 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 What's funny is all three of us have those guns. So he gave them back to us at some point. When the weekend's over, I'll give the guns I, back. I can't even imagine at what point he said, here you go, and handed them back to us. Because I promise you, the second he did, one of us shot somebody. Dude, if I was George, I would have firing squatted your asses with all your guns before I gave them back. So we're at Keith's house having a cookout. Right? Yeah. 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 Got our little guns with us. Right? <laughs> secretly. Secretly. Every time we think he's not looking, I'm shooting courts. Joe's shooting courts. <laughs> courts is shooting Joe. <laughs> Just a quick pop, pop. Right? We're shooting pool, and Joe's bent over to take a shot. Pop, pop. Give him no a couple in the way. Right? And because he's not going to make a scene because we don't want Keith to know we got our guns. Right? So he's doing this behind Daffron's oh, back yeah. in his house. Like We're in his house. Gotcha. We're in his house shooting each other. <laughs> and the next thing I know is I get to see Keith point blank take Joe's gun <laughs> point blank at Joe's skull and go pop, 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 pop and put four 
at point blank range <laughs> into Joe's skull. <laughs> now, if you know Joe, Joe will gut you for doing something stupid like that. Like yeah. there's no, uh, there's no reason. There's no sanity. That's, that's the, I lost my shit moment, right? Yeah. Like I will eviscerate your ass on your own floor and put your guts on the pool table and it won't, and I'll eat a sandwich and it won't bother me one bit. It's Keith. This is his boss. This is his right. boss, his boss. No, yeah, for right? sure. Yep. And there he stands. I'd be with like- this giant four red welts on his head. And Keith laughing like a son of a bitch. And the only reason he only shot him four times, that's mm. all he had left in it was four bullets. If 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 he would have had 32 in there, Joe would have looked like the African killer bees stung his head. First time you ever heard Joe say, thank you, sir, may I have another? It, it, it was. <laughs> so literally, he finished the game of pool and said, I think we should go. <laughs> and I, I think on the way home, Joe, yeah, was like, yeah, these fucking guns are done. They're going away. I'm I'm done with this shit. Guns were a terrible idea. Yeah. But yeah, I was like, holy shit, man, you all right? No, I'm not fucking all right. It hurt like hell. What are you going to do? What what am I going to do? You know, have a job? (laughs) Dude, that's nuts. Yeah. And I'm... Keith probably doesn't even remember doing it. It was... I fucking guarantee he does. He's got to remember people bringing airsoft guns to his sales training meetings or dealer meetings or something. Oh, God. Yeah, but yeah, the fun bunch, the fun bunch got put in their place by George and Keith with the quickness. I mean, hey, you guys, you guys sold some boats. You hit your numbers. Ranger was number one in market oh. share. I mean, yeah. oh god, get the airsoft guns out, baby. No, I uh, believe it or not, <laughs> we don't. The Skeeter world is so different, so different for me. I'm. It's a little bit. Got a you got your button up shirt now? Yeah, well, it's Yamaha, Mr. Right? Corporate it's, Thompson. It's, it's Yamaha, Yamaha, Yamaha. No more gunslinging uh, Ranger Thompson. No, no, none of that now wild cowboy shit. Nope, nope, not at all. Yamaha is very, very. Yeah, paintball. Nope. You switch paintball. Yeah, got Yamaha's, a Tipman '98 custom. Got Yamaha's you a, spider. a different world. Now. Yamaha? Oh, yeah. No, you don't fuck with those guys. Those guys are fucking samurais. They're all about respect. You're goddamn right. And And not delivering engines on time? I'm sorry. I had to do it. Yeah, whatever. I'm done. Why would they be worried about delivering Mm. engines to boats they don't own? Yeah, why would they? We don't care about market share. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, had, had you just not started ordering just mercury you'd probably still have your yamahas dude i had a guy wait two years for a yamaha he loved it so much it's a great fucking motor and Mm -hmm. i'd sell more of them if we could get them if if skeeter wasn't hogging all of them we might be able to sell a few you're talking about a boat company they're not going to slow down so yeah i would say don't hold your breath waiting on a yamaha my woman's bladder ain't slowing down right now dude yeah i broke the seal christ Christ. He says Christ. <laughs> He's like, Christ, what's wrong with you? I heard you fucked around with pe- random people with a coyote call <laughs> in Arkansas. Oh, that coyote call was so much fun because it had, it had all kinds of shit on it. And yeah, you just roll up, you know, somebody, some poor bastard sitting on a bench, you know, over by gas and staring at the river, looking at the beautiful fog. And we'd let out a, oh with the wolf and you'd watch him about crawl out of his skin like a werewolf was about to come out of the woods after him and yeah that, so those, that got that got taken away from us also just so you know <laughs> the, the predator called I, i'm pretty sure george had a, a an old school desk drawer yep. that he would take our toys away and put them in <laughs> yeah once again how how that guy never just tied three rocks to three of us and threw us in the river there yeah no you guys should be at the bottom of both shoals after some of that for sure oh god so who so who's so who's the culprit behind the airsoft guns and the predators is that matt thompson or joe carlson dave, and where's newman so, in all this so dave bentley I, it was either dave or joe that was responsible for the predator call uh, joe i i would say joe was the culprit for owning it because joe always had every tool known to man for for 
hunting. Sure. But Dave would have certainly brought it out at the most inopportune time. <laughs> Airsoft guns was quartz because quartz made the mistake of buying some shitty little poop poop. And, of course, Joe and I had to get, well, we got to beat you got that. got the AR-15s right? of attention all smallmouth anglers. Have you thrown the marabou jig? Have you thrown the hair jig? Well, if you have, you're going to want to listen right now. This podcast is brought to you by Veselka Fishing and Customs, a custom rod shop based out of Minnesota, and he has developed the answer, folks. What if I told you you could throw that marabou jig 30 to 50% further than you're casting it right now? Well, the well, Dane, Mr. Veselka himself, has developed the answer. It's a custom 8-foot hair jig rod developed on a steelhead fly blank. He's put custom fly guides on this, so you're really going to be able to outcast the competition, catch more smallmouth. They aren't going to see you. What more do you need? Here's what I need you to do right now. Visit VeselkaFishing.com. That's V-O-C-E-L-K-A Fishing.com. This is the eight-foot hair jig rod, but this guy can build you anything you want. If you can dream it, he can do it. This episode is brought to you by Just North of Memphis Barbecue. This is world champion barbecue. If you smoke meat and you don't like good barbecue, I do not know what to tell you right now besides you need to try some of this stuff. They've got their rub. They've got their sauces right on their website. They've got their famous dry rub award-winning seasoning that you can put on ribs, brisket, pulled pork, chicken, wings, anything you like to put on the smoker, on the oven, on the grill, any meat you like to cook, you need some of this dry rub seasoning in your life. But don't forget the sauce because that's award-winning world champion sauce here. No matter what flavor you like, they've got three different sauces and they are all good. You can drink them straight out the bottle. We've got Sweet Christie's for all you sweet loving barbecue folk. We've got Christie's Mischief for all you spicy bass anglers out there. And then we've got Christie's Gold. And they'll sell all three of them in a combo. But you need to go to their website right now. It's jnomemphis.com. That's jnomemphis.com. Dry rub, sauce, barbecue. Let's go! There, so no, we yeah. had the yeah, we had pistols, but they were you know CO two cartridges and Whoa. oh yeah, 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 they were they were deadly. <laughs> but I will tell you, so when we had our little chase with Mark, when he went in shields, he came back out, and he was loaded to the teeth. So that night, with the retribution was pretty brutal. So that was my question after you absolutely. So I'm this was guess, off the record I'm when you told Court me this spent, story? I'm going to guess Court spent his entire winnings from that year on airsoft supplies while he was inside Shields. That was just told <laughs> off the record. Are we willing to bring that on no. that one on the record? No. Okay. No. Just the, the Courts just getting no, an airsoft shooting you, not uh, the you shooting Courts yeah, part? All you need to know about airsoft is that Courts shot me in the mouth through a door. Gotcha. Yeah. And there was no drive-by the mark. Court and shootings and by was, your was, part. And there was one rule. Yep. No no face shots. Yeah. It's a pretty simple rule, right? Nothing above the neck. Who who sticks a barrel through the crack in the door? And, and now, first off, I'll blame myself because apparently in order for me to peek, close one eye and peek through a crack in the door, that means I got to hang my mouth wide open like an idiot, Right. But Quartz shot me directly in the mouth. Dude, I'm not going to lie. This sounds like me at fucking hockey tournaments when I was in squirts. Yeah, but you were squirts, not a grown, grown Exactly. Adult. That's what's fucking hilarious about uh, it. Grown adult. So, yeah. So, <clears throat> there's, yeah. There, there, there's, there's some some past. You're goddamn legend. <laughs> there's some past. There's, there is so much. So much shit that how how we survived it, how we continued to climb through it, 
I, I, I mean, literally, we took a factory tour one time, and it, they were so proud of the factory. I mean, so proud. I mean, this place is right. Huge. Oh yeah. I, I mean, it was like the, the literally you're touring the Vatican, right? Yeah. Now you're now for it's a, some now reason it's not that for anymore, some but. reason everywhere we went, there were like these giant ass prehistoric moss everywhere. Moths. Moss. Moths. Moss. Moths. And Bentley was wearing a, a ranger coat with the hood. Remember yep. the old school like members only jacket, but it had a hood. Yeah, no. When you bought a Ranger, yeah, you got the jacket. Like, so that was, the of thing. course, Bentley's wearing got his jacket. coat because you know we're at the plant, so I got to wear my coat. And I'm like, everybody's got that coat. Nobody else wore it. Take that shit off, you know. Yeah, just wear a like, normal shirt. Wear they, a Letterman's they jacket Ranger, to school that's every why day, you're here, like, dude. So he's walking around. Well, for an hour and a half of walking around, every moth I found, I put in his hood. And, I mean, it was to the point where that hood was literally filled with these giant-ass prehistoric-looking moss. And it was just filled. Well, to go to from this side over to where they made the poltrusion, you had to go outside. And when we opened the door, it was raining out, right? So Bentley starts going along. Immediately, he's getting rained on. So what's he do? Now he's the tough guy. Ah, I bet everybody wishes they had their hood. And he throws his hood up. Got my ranger jacket <laughs> on, baby. And when we walked into the next plant and he pulled that hood off and he's got all these fucking moss on his head. And these things had like the the kind of powder on their wings. It was like somebody dumped a bag of flour on his head. <laughs> 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 so he's got like these wet, dead moss stuck to it <laughs> and all this moth powder all over his hair and not a clue he's like ah yeah <laughs> these guys are all giving me shit about wearing a hood <laughs> i bet they all wish they had one now no no we're pretty good dude <laughs> yeah dude oh god moth yeah. dust moth dust yeah they they used to have us so they had this beautiful beautiful drinking fountain with a sign above it that said please don't pee in the bubbler <laughs> What? And, and 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 everybody laughed because they called it a bubbler. I'm like, really? That that that's what's funny to you? Not the fact that they had to tell people not to cut a whiz in it? Because right. the reason you would hang up a sign that says don't piss in the bubbler is because somebody pissed in the bubbler. Right. I mean, that that's how you make a rule is somebody broke the rule. Somebody brought airsoft guns to the dealer meeting. Yeah. Please don't pee in the bubbler. Well, at least he said please. No face shots. No face shots. One rule. Don't shoot me in the face. Okay. Yeah. No face shots. Right no face shots mouth. and no pissing in the bubble. Seriously, it looked like I had a pizza in my lip. <laughs> Fucking words. What else? What else you want to know? I mean. I, uh, yeah. What's your favorite muscular? Like, just out of, like, curiosity. Just say anything, top water. I don't care whether it's a prop or a walk the dog as long as I, I so it, it's funny because I told you I would rather I, I'll, I would rather catch a four pounder on a chicken than a seven pounder on a fucking drop shot. Right. Yep. I would rather catch a 30 incher on a topwater bait than catch a 50 pounder trolling. Well, trolling, yeah. trolling to me is, you know, when That's, somebody's like, oh, I caught a 50 incher. We might we as were, well just go have some high lifes. We're out trolling. It's like, it, 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 so you, you mean the rod went off and it was your turn instead of the 87 year old woman that was sitting there. Right. Right. So, yeah. Nice job reeling that fish in. Way to go. There's a little bit to trolling with the diving of the bait and the, and oh, the distance I'm not telling of the you. line. No, no, no. There is an art to trolling. So, I, and I know you're not fucking just saying, like, there's no skill to trolling. It's just not your bag, baby, right? The whole point of muskie fishing, muskies, like I said, they're not smart, and mm -hmm. they really don't fight. But what they do is their strike is unmatched in fresh water. There, there's nothing that compares to a musky strike it's yeah and that first initial surge their their head shake their curls 
their jump, their tail walk, their everything they do, and that initial, oh my God, things have gone bad. Yep. Is awe inspiring. From that point on, you're reeling in a trash bag full of water, right? Interesting. It's yep. like, I don't care. So if I'm not getting. If if that strike and that initial surge all happened to my rod in the rod holder, I don't care about reeling it in. Right. So. Well, there's like there's a guy I know. Uh, his name's Steve Enoch. I played hockey with his son as a kid, and uh, he's a really he's a really just naturally good fisherman, uh, musky angler, but really good bass fisherman too because of he's very similar thinks very similarly to you and it's very it's interesting it it almost seems like i'm talking to him a little bit but i i haven't talked to him in so long uh but he makes his own baits like with a wood lathe oh yeah um like he'll make creeper baits he'll make kind of all kinds of different and he's very particular and he he's a he's a He's like one of those pure ass musky anglers. He's from Wisconsin. Um, well, there you go. All the good but, ones are right, but like with baits and shit. And this is getting a little nerdy here, but like I remember that pacemaker. Yeah, was made of wood, and I'm like, oh, this is a cool bait. He's like, yeah, they don't they don't make it anymore, and and it, you can't find it anymore, and they make it out of plastic now and it's not as good. And I remember there was a time we were up at Lake of the Woods. Uh, I went with him for a week and it's, you know, he would even call it cheating up there, but they weren't eating like the louder baits. So we switched to a top kick, which is a little bit quieter. I think top water than a pacemaker, but there's a lot to that musky bait stuff. And like, I guess you well, you'll lived find, in it and well, I mean, any, any sport, exactly. Like we talked about Dustin Bufflin, right? Right. There's, there's that guy. Yep. The guy who made that pacemaker is a guy named Ty, Ty Sennett. Young, young, young guy in the now in the grand scheme of things, right? Especially when he was making that bait, he was a young guy. He he is in the musky world. He would be your Noah Schultz. Sure. And in, in, in fishing like the PMTT circuit and things like that. He's, he's that guy. Yep. And he's a guide on the Chippewa flowage. And yeah, that, that bait was, it was earth shattering. When he first made that thing, it did, it made noises that nobody had ever heard. It was like the Whopper Plopper before the Whopper Plopper, or was that before like the Dahlberg deal? No, like, the, the, there's two different deals. There hasn't been an original well, I shouldn't say that. For a long time, there hadn't been an original design in musky. Everything was a modification of something else. Sure. Whether it was a bucktail, and now instead of tying out a bucktail, you're tying it a squirrel hair, and now you're tying out a marabou, and now you're tying it, right? Yep. But you really only had three kind of blades. You had a willow blade, a Colorado blade, or an Indiana blade, right? Right, right, right. Then came along the, the the magnum blades and two blades, right? Nobody had ever seen two blades on it, including the fish. And good Lord, good God, did that thing put not only fish in the boat, but numbers of giant fish. Musky Mayhem came out with the cowgirl, yeah. and it literally turned the musky world on its ear. Right. The most Everyone unique, throws that fucker. <laughs> Yeah, but the most unique thing that happened in Muskie that now is so so standard, it's uh -huh. literally like a jig worm or a Ned rig now, Sure, right, was the bulldog. Right. Every bait had either been made out of fur, plastic, or wood, period. Yep. That, was, that was your three options, fur, plastic, or wood, yep. right? Yep, yep. Muskie Innovations came out with the Bulldog. <laughs> yeah, dude. Big and rubber. that Bulldog set off a revolution that literally brought Muskie world. The, the, so, I mean, I can remember when you would see two Muskie boats and you knew who they were. 
And now in a spot, you might see 12 boats and 11 of them. You don't have a clue who they are. And 10 boats, three guys apiece are all throwing giant rubber and cowgirls. Just, I mean, literally, it sounds like a, it's a ding through the air <laughs> and a shawap. <laughs> one pound chunk of rubber lands on the water. And, yeah. But if you, as you watch those boats... Three of them will be sticking their net in the water, so they're 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 catching them. But it's it, the jackhammer it's, for muskies. Well, or whatever. It, yeah. you know, and we talked about it like with the forward-facing sonar. People are like, "Oh, you got to ban it. You got to kill it." It. I'm all about if it brings new people to the sport, mm -hmm. and it brings new. Uh, it, if we're not improving, right, yep. and we're not growing, what are we doing? And so you ain't growing, you're dying. Well, and so lit, and, yeah, and it's, a, it's a double edged sword. Like I'll use the high school angler side of life, right? Yep. We we talk about how hard it's made it for people who are trying to legitimately make a living, feed their family in the sport of fishing, right. because the dollars are were already so. There was already so much competition for so few dollars. But if you were a player, you were a player. The problem is now is you've got players that can't get that sponsorship money because it's going to the high school and the college side of life, which it's real easy for I'm 50 years old, right? It's real easy for somebody my age to look at that and say, well, that's wrong. That can't happen. But at the same time, if you're on the side of the fence of the boat world, the electronics world, the rod world, the real world, the bait world, 50-year-olds aren't going to keep paying those bills. Right. It's, right. right. it's these high school and college anglers that are going to be buying this shit. Yep. Right? And, and you better have them on your side because if you don't, somebody else will. Yep. So – forward facing sonar i say man have at it if it's putting more people in our sport and more fish in the boat i'm all for it i, I really am because he'll allow it he'll allow it yeah are you not entertained you know he will allow it it's i i look at it like just because you can see a fish doesn't mean you can catch it. Right? You're goddamn they tried, right. They tried to ban the aqua view. I can't catch half of them that I see yeah. on that fucker. I, 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 so I'm going to use Hunter Wendt. <laughs> Do you think it's dawned on Hunter Went yet that forward-facing sonar cost him a boat? It also almost won him one. It almost won him one. But did he abandon it too late? And, and that's and that you is, can't only rub a woman's shoulders all night. I you know what I mean. You can't just rub her shoulders all yeah, night. It's there's, there's there's a lot of facets to the it. The problem is, is he could still see the fish, and that's where I fucking like I hear him yep. out like on that. If you're freaking like one more bite, yeah, one more bite, all, Matt. All gotta one do more is, bite, look, there's one, one more there's bite, Matt. There. One all more bite, one, one more bite, one more. Yeah, you know. It's like I said, it almost won them the boat, but did it cost them the boat? Every sword is, is double edged. Your greatest blessing is your greatest weakness, and you can't force it. And it's tough. Agreed. It's a tough game. And uh, Noah's an anomaly that way. I think Noah, we can agree that way that, he, like, you can't force it, but Noah's kind of like, uh, I don't think he forces it. Like, I think. And I mean this because I've been around, I've been around the TV fishermen. I've been around the walleye world. I've been around the musky world. I have never, and I mean this, for a single state, the anglers that are assembled for the Champions Tour, I don't know that you could find a more incredible group of talent and 50 anglers. 
Matt Thompson, how do you really feel? I I truly believe, I truly believe that the people who have come through the Champions Tour are the best in our state. I don't know, man. We're a bunch of fucking degenerates. We are. We are. But <laughs> if you look at the people that have come through and stuck I, it no, out. for sure. And for stuck sure. it out. Yeah. Every year we get a handful of people that are going to come in and show us how to do this and take our money. And Without every a doubt. year they're gone. She's a humbling bitch of a sport, ain't she? Yeah. But I look at the talent that's come through and that's there right now. And if the future... The future of Minnesota fishing. Future of tournament fishing is not easy, ladies and gentlemen. I'm like, gonna use. It's not easy out there. When when we talk about changing perspectives, right? And what what have what's yeah. changed about you, right? So this year was my my change of a year. One, like I said, I've never been in first place, so I had to I had to change the swinging for the fence to maintaining when I didn't want to maintain sometimes, but I had to maintain. I had to I had to be okay with fourth place for the first time. Yeah, but it's like, well, why aren't you okay with fourth place? Well, could I have won it? Right? Could I have gotten second? Who knows? But the biggest the biggest perspective for me and I hope Everybody who listens to this, and I hope everybody that fishes the Champions Tour or everybody who just fishes in general, my entire perspective changed without realizing it until it had happened. And so Jack Henney, the, the kid whose initials I had on my jersey all season, you know, when he was my boat marshal three years ago, at Lake Vermilion, it was, we spent an hour and a half during tournament time talking about everything he had been through, right? And his closing statement on it was, I'll never do it again. I'll never go through that again, right? But he had gone through a bunch of cancer and it was gone. So you don't think anything of it, right? Was... Anyone who's listening to this, there's unfortunately with cancer, there's nobody listening to this program that hasn't been affected by cancer totally somewhere in their life. And yeah. Jack's cancer came back and he was true to his word of I won't do it again. What changed my perspective on that is I had a kid in my boat for eight hours that never thought he was going to experience being in a boat again, right? And this is a kid. This is a 15-year-old kid at that time. 15 years old and, you know, never thought he was going to get to see Lake Vermilion or catch a bass again or, and, right? right. So right. The, the shit that we all take for granted literally was... Everything was over-the-top exciting for him. Sure. So the big thing that I focused on this year was making sure to put that extra effort with the boat marshals, right? Yep. Of if they ask a question, it doesn't just have to be yes, right? Let, let's take it a step further. Let's let's talk to them. Let's, it's a mentorship deal. It, it yeah. is and it isn't. It's right. so they're volunteering their time to spend eight hours watching some broke dick that can't <laughs> skip under a dock try and skip under a dock. A bunch right? of broke dicks for sure, dude. And for sure. Who am I when he asks a question to not answer it the best that I can? Right. Well, okay, not to argue with you, but you are fishing a fucking tournament, and you do need to focus. I am. You do it, need to focus. But without him, I'm not fishing that tournament. But that kid has a privilege to learn for eight hours. But how does he learn he be, if he can't ask you a question? Watch. Mm. He can ask, but what I'm saying is, is if you're in the zone, 
like don't take yourself out of the zone. So here's and that's it, my opinion. But differ. I'm young and stupid still, and I'm learning. So here's where this I is maybe on. my lesson. But here's where I differ on that, because you don't know outside of that eight hours where that kid's at, right? Unfortunately, these kids are dealing with shit that we never dealt with. Things are different in life now, right? And I to mean, me, if I got a kid that it wants to talk, right? Yep. And is willing to be there for me for eight hours. That's fair. I owe it to him to yep. be there for him for eight hours. That's fair. Now, on the on saying that, these kids are all tournament fishermen also. Right. So if if you say, hey, I got to uh, just give me a second here. I got to kind of focus. Yeah, they're all in or they'll typically tell you, they are. And, and you'll find with them, they'll they'll for the most part, save their questions for, you know, hey, the, how come you were doing this or. Yep. Right. Yep. But. You don't you, you never know what you got until it's gone. Yep. Right. And I had a kid that changed my entire outlook on taking shit for granted yeah. that I, I'll i never be able to thank him, right? Right. He, right. he changed the way I think. And I, yeah, I don't ever, ever want one of these kids to walk away from a day in the boat with me and not not tell everybody that's standing there man i hope you draw him next time right right yep that's that's what i want mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i so i found myself this year asking him at the end of the day what'd you learn yep right and when you ask him that it's like Okay, I was thinking you maybe learned a new knot, you know, but I learned, I heard perseverance, right? Never giving up. That was the river. I was in 50th place, three hours into the tournament, finished in fourth, right? I heard not, not, <laughs> not second guessing yourself. Right, 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 right. My Vermilion kid said, would you do it again? Absolutely not. Well, that's what I learned. Right? Yep. Win, lose, or draw. If that's what I decide to do, that's what I'm doing. Right. So I, I had a kid tell me, I want to be you. And I don't, I, when, I'm, when, I, when it's time for me to fish, he's, I want to be the big fish guy. I want to be you. I want to fish like you. And I told him, don't be me. Do I, you, how do man. you know that the best version of you isn't way better than me? So true. Right? Yeah. So I, as much as it's an honor and a privilege and it's incredible to hear those things, these, these kids are our future. They are. Yeah. They are. They're the future of this sport. And without them, I don't know what there is a champions tour. I mean, we're fucked. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're, we are. Because I know my wife's not coming to be a boat marshal. No, so, I don't even have a wife. We're, well, yeah. So, yeah, that's, I guess, if, if there's anything that I could say is, man, you get an opportunity to have one of these kids. And I hear it all the time. Well, these kids are annoying assholes. What? Uh, right? Not not the boat marshals about high school fishermen. Oh. And they can you be. know who I blame? Us. Us. Yeah. I if, agree. if if I'm a it's dickhead, if I'm an absolute arrogant prick all day in the boat, right? What did I just teach that kid? To be an arrogant prick. To be an arrogant boat. prick. Yep. If I'm cutting people off and I don't care. That's not what you do, bro. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? Yep, yep, so yep, it's yep. it's not the kid's fault. It's no different than when I see a bad dog. I don't blame a dog. Dogs well, aren't born bad. Okay. So I think a lot of it is there. It's kind of like if you ever, I played hockey as a kid, right? And 
it's almost like the parents were more competitive than the kids yeah. sometimes. Yep. I think there's a lot of that going on. I and think so. I think that that can I think a lot of parents can are contribute living to that. vicariously through their kids. Hundred percent. Which and more power to them, but at the same time, these kids have no concept right now of reality, right? They they're all getting a trophy, right? They all they go fish their tournaments, and everybody's a winner. Well, guess what? When it's time for you to step into the Champions Tour, there's only one winner. Yep, uh, one. One guy is leaving with twelve thousand dollar check. Forty nine yep. are leaving without it. Correct. Right? There is no participation trophy. That's a there fact. is no second place crystal trophy. No. Nope. He, he gets. I don't. Need, there's no second place trophy. I got second. Yeah. It's no trophy. For no second. They're, they're, they're literally. No. Nope. All gotten, tricks. You get a box with an all tricks in. Yeah. It, which is I'm not complaining here. No. Bro. No. Not complaining here. Not bro. one bit. Not but complaining. What I'm saying is, is the I I'm. I, it, I'm so, and I'll use Tom Parker, Tommy Parker's dad, right? I think Tom Parker gets it because when you talk to Tommy, I think Tommy gets it, right? Jacob Novak. Jacob Novak works. He works for his dad, right? There's He knows the value of what he's got. But I've seen kids come through that have zero Zero concept, right? They've got a truck. They've got a boat. They've, they're driving around with a quarter million dollars worth of equipment. And they don't have a job. They don't have a job, yep. right? And these are the same kids that are going to tell you, well, I'm a, I'll be the next Seth fighter. Really? Because did, did you win? Well, I got six plays. Yeah, then... You're not going to be the next Seth fighter. You better win, and you better win a lot. He won a lot. A lot. The guy won everything he did. A lot. I fished against him. It was... Jim Moyno won everything he did. Yep. John Figgy won everything he did. Yep. Right? Yep. <laughs> so, Kyle Shuda won everything he did. Dean Capra, Brad Leiferman, Shane Raveling. Right? I mean... Tony Hatton. Tony Hatton. Ron Mayer. I mean, I mean where does these it guys, end? I mean, there's a lot of guys not doing it anymore who've done it. Like, That's what I'm saying. It. There's just there's so many good fishermen in, in the world, in the state, and I'm just lucky to, to be able to have a few of them into the garage to have a few beers and oh, I love it. have a few high lifes, Matt. And I love it. Big Fish Matt Thompson, um, I, I think, I think this was one of one of my favorite conversations. Um, thanks for like driving out to the Bass Galaxy tonight, dude. Dude, I it, it is such an honor for me. So, and I mean this. It, I am so proud of the fact that I have never won one of these events yet. I've established myself doing it my way, what I like to do, what I love to do. And I've been successful enough at it that I'm sitting here in your garage talking to the galaxy, right? It's, to me, that's a win. Well, I mean, dude, you you belong in the galaxy, and you are our 2022 Champions Tour Angler of the Year. <laughs> Still can't get used Big to hearing that. Big Fish Matt Thompson <laughs> checking in. 